I'd like to welcome you for the Union Symposium number three on Cassini and future perspectives for the exploration of the outer solar system. My name is Stefanie Werner and my co-convener is Özgür Karatekin. And we have uh, two more chairpersons in the next part of the session, Linda Spilka and Athena Kostinis. And I also want to thank both of them and uh, Scott Eddington, who couldn't be here, for helping very much on organizing this symposium. And now I invite uh, Linda Spilker to give the presentation on Cassini's grand finale, highlights from a voyage into unique territory. <coughs> Well, good morning. The Cassini mission has truly been astonishing, and we have really revolutionized our understanding of the Saturn system. From the planet itself, to the complex rings, to the diverse moons around Saturn, to the very dynamic magnetic environment. And I'm going to focus in particular on the last year of Cassini's epic voyage, the grand finale, where we dove in between the planet and the rings. So how do I change that? This is an overview of Cassini's 13-year mission, shown against the backdrop of Saturn's 30-year orbital period. Cassini launched in 1997 after a seven-year cruise, arrived at Saturn in July 2004, in January 2005 dropped off the Huygens probe You'll be hearing more about the Huygens probe science from Jean-Pierre and also about the Titan science from Athena Kustenis. We arrived at Saturn just two years after northern summer solstice and after a four-year prime mission, spent two years on an equinox mission looking at the planet and the rings when the rings were edge on to the sun. That was followed by a seven-year solstice mission with our mission completing at Saturn northern summer solstice. And in that last year, in that green box, you can see our proximal or grand finale orbits and talk about. Uh, th this is a, a view of both the ring grazing and grand finale orbits. The ring grazing orbits are shown in gray. In November of 2016, a uh, close Titan flyby pulled our periaps in as close to the rings and Saturn as we had ever been during the mission. And then in April of 2017, another final close Titan flyby propelled us all the way across the rings into the gap between them. We were set up with periaps focused face toward noon to get good gravity flybys. This also provided excellent ring and Saturn occultations from the closest distances that we'd yet seen them. Next, next slide, I guess I'm going backward. And here's a movie of the 22 grand finale orbits, diving in between the rings and the planet. 22 orbits may sound like a lot, but we had so much science to accomplish, from the interior of the planet to close-ups of the rings and Saturn itself to studying that unique region in between the innermost rings and the top of Saturn's atmosphere. And this shows those orbits and the final orbit in red. We got little pushes from distant flybys of Titan and that final one, we call it Titan's Goodbye Kiss, sent Cassini plunging into the atmosphere of Saturn. Uh, on the next slide, uh, what you'll see here is an overview. This shows the distance from the center of Saturn on the y-axis as a function of time. The purple dashed line is the inner ring boundary, and those purple x's are the ring plane crossing distances. If you see a purple square around that, it just tells you that we use the high gain antenna as a shield. Uh, to point in the direction of the incoming ring particles to protect Cassini. Turns out the particles were all very tiny, and so we didn't have to worry uh, about those as the mission progressed. If you look at the purple, oops, if we go back. If we can go back to. Yeah, the, if you look at the, the orange pluses, those are the closest approach distances, and the orange dashed line shows the tumble density that we had from our models on reaction wheels for Cassini. And if you look at those final five orbits, the orange squares, they were actually on thrusters to keep Cassini carefully controlled. Now onto some of the science. 
Saturn's interior obviously was a key focus by pulling the spacecraft trajectory so close into Saturn. And these are the magnetic field measurements, three different components, the BR, B theta, and B phi components. The maximum field was around 18,000 nanotesla, well within the range that could be measured by the Cassini magnetometer. You can look at the first two components, and those are over ranges of, of an order of 10 to the fourth, and so very large fields in those two. But the azimuthal component, the bottom plot, look at the very different scale. It's a very small signal. In fact, so small that we were actually able so far to say that as an upper limit, the offset between the planet rotation axis and the dipole tilt is now less than 0 0.008 degrees. This is very small because we think you need an offset to the dipole from the spin axis to maintain the magnetic field, so an interesting puzzle. And if you look in that bottom plot, the azimuthal component, what you see there are a lot of field-aligned currents generated in the auroral regions. and so. The team, this is just the first nine orbits, working hard to take out those signals and see what might be left in the azimuthal component. And you'll hear more from Norbert Krupp. And the details of this are in a science paper uh, that has not yet been published, but we're working on those uh, science papers. Here's some of the gravity field results. What you're seeing is the magnitude of the various gravitational harmonics. Uh, plotted in, as a function of degrees, so you'd have J2, J3, all the way up to J12. What you see in this plot is the red symbols are for a uniform rotation rate. If Saturn is rotating completely uniformly throughout, the model would predict we would fall along the red symbols. Closed symbols are positive, open symbols are negative. And you can see here from our data, the black points, that as you get toward J8 and J10 in particular, that those values are significantly higher telling us that the uniform rotation model is not the model to use. The dashed line is uncertainty uh, from the measurements, and also uh, J3 and J5 were anomalous. So looks like the flows, the atmospheric winds extend to much greater depths. We know from Juno that's about 3,000 kilometers for Cassini. It appears to be quite a bit deeper. And Luciano S. will be giving a talk in this session, and Eli Galante has a talk also coming up on Friday. Here's a view from our first pass. We took a series of images. That red dot is showing you where we were on Saturn, increasing by an order of magnitude our resolution of the clouds. Uh, we called this the noodle. We went across not only the vortex, but the hexagon. You'll see a rotation here, and that's where we actually are turning the spacecraft to point the high gain antenna in the ram direction. And in looking at some of these noodles, there's the, the noodle we took in April put together. This was taken with wide angle frame and clear filter. We repeated this uh, experiment starting below the vortex in the near infrared and to compare two different levels of Saturn's atmosphere. And here's just a close up view of one of those and the atmospheric scientists said they'd never quite seen anything like this, the level of detail in the clouds at Saturn. We also looked at other wavelengths in particular focusing on this vortex, this giant hurricane centered right at the north pole of Saturn. There's a similar hurricane at the South Pole, which was in winter as we were at the end of Cassini's mission. Looking in the far infrared can actually measure the temperature of the atmosphere. And what the composite infrared spectrometer found is that the temperature is about 10 degrees Kelvin warmer than elsewhere at lower latitudes. The atmosphere is subsiding as, and it's compressing and heating as it goes down. Uh, so a very detailed uh, temperature map to go along with the images. Also from the visible and infrared mapping spectrometer data looking now in the near infrared and picking out three of their wavelengths, can look at red at five microns, that's looking at the thermal radiation coming up, it's very clear in the vortex. Green are the, is the cloud reflectivity above about 1.5 bars, those are the ammonia ice clouds, and blue is the hydrogen absorption, so you can build this false color view of what it looks like, and if you see black, that means that the clouds are thick enough to block the radiation. I like that little black cloud right at the center of the vortex. Here's a view from the ultraviolet imaging spectrograph of the aurora. You can see that very bright feature at Saturn's North Pole in the auroral region. And we can take these measurements from optical remote sensing and compare them to the fields and particles measurements, as well as ground-based measurements of the lit pole and understand more about the aurora and the precipitation of particles that are causing this phenomena. A little bit onto the rings, we got some of the highest resolution images of the rings of the entire mission. And this is one of my favorites. 
It's of a wave that's generated inside of Saturn's rings. It's the Janus 2 to 1 spiral density wave. Our tiny moon Janus is in a resonance in this location in the rings. At the launch of the wave, those particles go around exactly two times for every single orbit of Janus, launching this beautiful wave. Now, Janus shares an orbit with another moon, Epimetheus, and these moons are so large that their orbits are close enough they cannot physically pass. But every four years, they do an intricate dance back and forth and change places. And that's actually expressed in this density wave. You see tiny glitches where the pattern appears to be broken, and that's this four-year swap. So you have a time <coughs> history across the rings from this wave. And in the upper left-hand corner, that part of the wave was launched during the early 1980s, the time of the Voyager flybys. Here's another view of plateaus in the sea ring, that bright, broad feature. There are more particles there. What confines these plateaus, we're not sure. But in these high-resolution views, we can actually look for as muthal structure. And by subtracting out the uniform structure, what's left is that gray band in the middle telling you the degree of clumping going on inside the rings. And in fact, we see a series of different textures from streaky textures inside the plateau. Then just outside of it, the particles appear uniform. And then we go on to what we call clumpy straw-like textures. So uh, you know, very scientific and technical terms uh, to describe uh, these phenomena. And so the particles appear to clump throughout Saturn's rings, and especially here in the sea ring plateaus. We also got a close-up look of these tiny objects that we nicknamed propellers. There are tiny embedded moonlets that are actually trying to open a gap. That gap is the two bright arms of the propellers. They're not massive enough to completely open a gap around the rings. And these tiny little moonlets are very similar to the bodies you might find in a protoplanetary disk, those tiny planetesimals from which the planets in our solar system formed. And these moonlets are the largest objects in the rings, and yet they migrate back and forth in a very unpredictable way. And so by understanding the migration and the, the, what happens in Saturn's ring disk, it's a good analogy for the protoplanetary disk. And it's interesting, these propeller objects seem to group in bands. There are, there are populations of them together. You can see that in the bottom right panel, the little circles where you can actually see this grouping of propeller objects. Maybe a, an object actually broke apart in Saturn's rings, and these are the larger fragments that are left over. We also were close enough to turn our radar experiment onto Saturn's rings. And we actually received a radar signal back from the rings. So not just the surface of Titan, but actually looking at the rings themselves. And looking at these uh, long wavelengths, we can now then compare at other wavelengths to occultation data to better understand the rings. And in particular, at radar wavelengths, you're looking deeper into the ring particles and can better understand any non-icy fragments that might be underneath their icy crust, so this work is ongoing. Here's one of the radio science occultations of the rings, looking at the rings from the inside out. What you're seeing across the top panel is the black line is showing you where in the rings you're looking. That central peak is the X-band signal from which we can derive the opacity of the rings. But what's so interesting is being so close, you see a very broadened signal, this scattered signal telling you about the complexity of the particles within the rings. Uh, you get to the B3 region, that ring is, that part is so optically thick, the signal disappears completely. And then as you go out into other parts of the B ring, the structure in this scattered signal is telling you something about the viscous overstability, the way the ring particles clump. And there's even, it's even present in the ringlets in the Cassini division. In the A ring, it's really interesting. It takes on a bimodal structure, and we're actually sampling now the wakes that are present as you go out into the A ring as the particles clump into longer and longer structures, ephemeral but clumping nonetheless. Along with measuring the internal uh, gravity structure of the planet itself, getting in this close allowed us to get the mass of the rings as well. And before we had this set of orbits, the uncertainty was about 100% on the mass of the rings. And the mass is key because it tells you about the age of the rings themselves. The Voyager value is about 0.75 times the mass of Mimas. If you could scoop up all Saturn's ring particles, they'd be about that mass. It turns out that estimate is not far off. It's a little bit smaller, but the error bars on the data we've looked at so far are quite large, and Luciano will tell you more about that. But the smaller mass points to young rings, maybe only the, on the order of 100 million years old or so. 
So it looks like the rings are young uh, from this mass measurement. There's another, another way to get at the mass of the rings as well. And that comes from the cosmic dust analyzer. You can think of it as a dust telescope and it can measure the amount of pollution occurring in the rings from these particles, interplanetary dust particles coming in uh, and polluting and darkening the rings. This material is primarily silicates and some carbon, so it darken it very quickly. So by measuring the rate of this flux, one can calculate the age of the rings. And so with these two methods, we get an age date from the rings that shows that they're only maybe a few hundred million years old. And if you think about that, life existed on Earth only 100 million years ago, and it turns out that perhaps Saturn's rings as they exist today formed about the time of the dinosaurs. Finally, we sampled the region in between the innermost ring boundary and the top of Saturn's atmosphere, and that profile is shown here. The innermost ring boundary is shown in orange, and Saturn's surface taken at the one bar level. And there's just a whole host. It was really nice to be able to move those orbits up and down with the distant flybys of Titan to be able to sample throughout this region from very close to the ring boundary to the final five orbits actually dipping our toe in Saturn's atmosphere. And there are a number of papers submitted to science and talks as well that will go into these details. I just want to hit a few of those highlights. One of those came from the magnetosphere imaging instrument in that the detectors there actually measured D-ring grains, and they measured these grains in a very small, narrow region, just plus or minus two degrees about the equator, finding that the atmospheric drag of Saturn is actually pulling these D-ring particles in, and that orange trajectory shows you the trajectory of a D-ring grain uh, coming you know, into the atmosphere of Saturn directly. And this was a very unexpected that this instrument that usually measures you know, uh, particles in the magnetic field, electrons, protons, neutrals, et cetera, is actually now measuring the effects of these D-ring particles. The cosmic dust analyzer, they too saw this region coming from the D-ring. But also, if you look on the panel on the right at the various colors, they saw populations south of the ring plane. And that white line is a trajectory of a charged ring particle going into the atmosphere of Saturn. We call it ring rain because the ring particles uh, are predominantly uh, water ice, although it's very interesting to look at those particles in the region in between. Uh, basically seeing silicates and water ice in the cosmic dust analyzer spectra, and uh, they can actually measure grain size. And it turns out that the grains on average are smaller than about 0.7 microns in this region in between the rings and the planet. And there's a talk by uh, Ralph Schrama on Friday, and uh, there's a paper also on this <coughs> submitted to science. The ion and neutral mass spectrometer recorded an extremely complex spectrum in this region as well. And Hunter Waite will be talking more about the talk in this session, and Mark Perry has more information on Friday. Uh, besides seeing the usual suspects like water, there's a whole host of different sizes of organics, completely all the way out to the limits of the 100 atomic mass units. And so just really remarkable uh, to see this much complexity in a spectrum as these particles vaporize, and then their spectrum can be sampled by the ion and neutral mass spectrometer. Amimi also saw a new radiation belt inside this region. And what's shown here is a profile of the, the L shell and the intensities of the radiation belt. If you look at blue, those are what we knew, the known radiation belts average across the mission. You can see the dropouts at the orbits of the various satellites. Uh, then we also had in aqua the proximal or uh, orbit raw data, and then the orange is the data that the MIMI experiment saw. And it's very interesting to see the connection between this radiation belt and the D-ring itself. Just a little bit about those ring grazing orbits. It gave us an opportunity to fly very, very close to some of these tiny ring moons just at the uh, edge of Saturn's rings, or actually within the rings itself. I'm going to show a blow up from the blue arrow. And here are three of those tiny moons that we saw. Pan orbits in the Enki gap and actually creates and keeps the gap open. You can see there are actually ringlets and material in the gap as well. Tiny Daphnis is keeping the Keeler gap open. And then Atlas orbits just outside the edge of the A ring. And from these incredibly close flybys, uh, here's what we saw of those moons. 
uh, the three of them side by side, they have these huge ridges of ring particles around them or skirts of material. It's very interesting to note the differences between them. Uh, the ridge on Pan is much more compact and looks more solid than the ridge on Daphnis. And it appears that the central body around which the ring particles coalesce is actually bigger for Pan than it is for, Daphne, or for Atlas. And you can see this very smooth structure. And Daphnis might actually have two ridges. It looks like a little ob oblate object. And uh, Bonnie Barati is going to talk more about the icy satellites as part of this session. And this is another one of my very favorite pictures. You know, here is Daphnis caught in the act of creating a very beautiful wave along the edge of the Keeler gap. And turns out Daphnis has a slight inclination relative to the ring, so it pulls particles up and down vertically as well as horizontally. And if you look all the way over to the left, that third wavelength, you can see it looks like the wave is actually disconnecting from the edge of the ring. And you can just see a hint of a tiny ringlet a tiny piece of ring material pulled away uh, from Daphnis. So there's a huge interplay between the ring particles themselves and these tiny moons. And it's great to see it at this high resolution. Not only did we get all of these wonderful images during the last year of the mission, we also took pictures from Saturn of every planet in our solar system except for Mercury. Mercury is just too close to the sun to be able to take a, a picture of it with our cameras. And it's interesting, you can kind of think of this as an analogy for perhaps looking at exoplanets. But here's the, the view of the solar system uh, taken from Cassini's perspective. And this is our final farewell image to Saturn, uh, a series of pictures taken and put together into this very beautiful mosaic, a very fitting uh, farewell to this incredible world and uh, Cassini's epic journey. Here's Cassini's final 90 seconds. The X-band is shown in the top plot. S-band, that tiny signal that is our final connection to Cassini. We're traveling at 34 kilometers per second. So that the, when the atmosphere got thick enough, probably only the, about the density that the space station would experience, that pulled the high gain antenna away. And you can see first the X-band signal and then the S-band signal. And that marked the end of the mission. It happened around five in the morning Pacific time. And here's the Cassini family waving goodbye on September 15th. And it was very hard to say goodbye to this incredible spacecraft. But I just feel lucky that we were there with Cassini's eyes to see the Saturn system. And also we had our families with us uh, early in the morning. And I was fortunate enough to have my two daughters, Jessica and Jennifer, and granddaughter Audrey to be with me for Cassini's grand finale. Now, what I'd like to show you is a video that we showed right after the end of the mission. It shows the highlights of Cassini set to music and I think a fitting end for a great mission.
when I see that movie, I immediately say, I want to go back. Thank you. You have answered already my first question. <laughs> Any other questions? I could just add, currently there are no plans uh, on the books to go back to Saturn, but hopefully uh, that will change. There are opportunities perhaps for a Saturn probe mission, as we had for Galileo, uh, very interesting activity on Enceladus to explore further, Titan itself. So. Hopefully, uh, we'll see something come along. I guess you're all excited about the details. And therefore, I will introduce now Jean-Pierre Le Breton on the Cassini-Huygens mission, Huygens Legacy. Okay, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, I'm going to talk about the Huygens legacy, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to cover uh, several topics. Um, you know, the mission itself, the science, some of the issues, operational issues, technical issues we have. And as we need to look uh, beyond uh, where we are now to the future, I will uh, address uh, my own view of how we could look into the future. <coughs> okay, so I'm Jean-Pierre Lobreton. I'm now um, associated scientist in two labs in France, but I used, um, I used to work at ESA on various uh, positions for the Cassidy Huygens mission. So how do I <coughs> click? Yes. So the, the topics I'm going to address. So I'm going to give a, a summary on the Huygens mission, the so science highlights, and in fact, I know, So I'd like to click. Hey. Yes. Uh, I don't know if it's still available uh, but, uh, uh, at the Springer stand, but there is a nice book um, which we, uh, we have put together some, uh, some time ago regarding tight on from Cassini Huygens. So I would encourage you to, to go and see if, if this book is still available. Uh, I'm going to address a little bit myself the future exploration of Titan. Yes, uh, I mean, Linda uh, said we will go back uh, sooner or later uh, to Saturn, to Titan, to Enceladus. So maybe there is some hope for Titan. I'm going to talk about technical and operation issues because I think that's important to, um, to be aware that, um, you know, Huygens was a difficult mission. This was the first mission of its kind for for the European Space Agency, and not everything has gone as smoothly as it could have gone. So I just want to, to say a few words about that, and I will give my personal views on international collaboration. So Titan, the largest moon of Saturn, the second largest moon of the solar system after Jupiter the Ganymede. Uh, it's a big moon. It's the only moon with an atmosphere. It's a thick atmosphere. Its thickness is more than 1,500 kilometers, uh, and it's dense. The pressure at the surface of Titan is 1.5 bar, and the major constituents are nitrogen, 95 to 98%, and methane, which really makes it very exciting. I mean, the organic uh, chemistry, uh, <coughs> which comes from uh, methane and nitrogen, is really very exciting at what makes this place so unique in the solar system. Uh, on the left, you see an image of a Voyager. Uh, Titan's surface was uh, remained uh, invisible to the Voyager camera, which could only <coughs> look into the, <coughs> the visible. So the surface, the atmosphere, was somewhat known, but the surface of Titan was completely unknown when we started to design the Huygens mission. Huygens' mission was carried out during the, on the second, the third orbit around Saturn. So Saturn orbit insertion in July 2004, and we carried the mission at the end of, to release at the end of 2004. And the mission itself, entry, descent, and landing took place on the 15th of January 2005. And 
in this illustration, you see that the orbiter was placed to be uh, to act as a radio relay for the signals which were transmitted from Huygens to Cassini. Uh, this is the uh, scenario entry. Uh, can I use a, yes entry? So fast entry at six kilometers per second within a few minutes. Huygens had slowed down to Mach 1.5. And this initiated the deployment of a series of three parachutes, a small parachute to remove the back cover and uh, to deploy the main parachute, which allowed to remove the heat shield. And then 15 minutes later, we deployed the final third parachute at 110 kilometers, which allowed us to, down, to go down to the surface within two and a half hours. So the data uh, were transmitted uh, by Huygens to Cassini. The total duration of the transmission was two hours and 28 minutes, and one hour and 12 minutes on the surface. So this is what we got through Cassini. But we also had set up a, a network of radio, big Earth radio telescope, which allowed us to pick up uh, the little signal uh, from Huygens, and I'm going to say more about that. And we, we listened to Huygens for more than three hours on the surface. And we know by analysis, that um, Huygens died when the batteries, uh, because Huygens was on batteries, when they got empty. And uh, our estimation is that uh, we uh, survived another 20 minutes, I think, when we lost signal from the, the Parks ground station in, in Australia. <coughs> so uh, this is what I'm addressing here, the detection of the Huygens radio signal. So we, got, we did not get the data, of course, but uh, we got the uh, faint carrier, which allowed us to, to measure the Doppler, uh, which we had uh, somewhat lost uh, with the normal link to Cassini. I will return to that. So we had set up a network of 18, uh, 17 radio telescopes distributed um, on the face. We selected, of course, the one which were facing uh, the uh, Titan. So in, in the States first, in Hawaii, and eventually in, uh, <clears throat> in Japan, in China, and in Australia. So here are the two biggest radio telescopes, Green Bank here, which caught the first signal, and for about one hour, maybe. And then um, Parkes, the late, second greatest uh, telescope, took over and followed Huygens down to the rest of the descent under the surface for several hours. And this is uh, the little signal here, uh, which uh, we, uh, one of the first signal which we picked up from Green Bank. Uh, and we picked up the signal in real time, quasi real time, the transmission time at the speed of light was about 80 or 82 minutes. Uh, we picked up the, the signal from Green Bank and Parks because they were equipped with very sensitive radio receivers which were provided by the uh, radio science group at JPL, but we somewhat picked up the signal from the 17 telescopes in, uh, in, in the network. But the two one, Green Bank and, Spa, and Parks, got the signal in quasi real time. Yeah. So in summary, Huygens, um, 14th of January 2005, the entry, descent, and landing. This is the most distant landing in the solar system so far. Hopefully, in the future, an object will land further than, uh, than that. And this is the first landing on another moon uh, other than Earth. So the atmosphere, uh, nitrogen and methane, the temperature in the atmosphere is very cold. On the surface, is, it was minus 100 Celsius. It is minus 100 Celsius, and the pressure is 1.5 bar. So uh, just a few uh, slides as to what Huygens did to lift the veil of Titan haze. Uh, first of all, the, Hug the temperature profile. Uh, so this is temperature, pressure, and altitude. So um, here you see in, um, in do uh, dotted lines the uh, simulated the model of the Huygens uh, atmosphere, of the Titan atmosphere. And this model uh, was a result of a, of a real uh, hard work from um, uh, two guys, Emmanuel Lelouch, I think Emmanuel is here, and Don Hanton. They really made 
a very nice so-called engineering model of Titan, which was really the, the reference for designing the Pro mission. So, and they got it pretty white. Um, and in dark lines, the dark line are the measurements. At high altitudes, I mean, there were deviations due to, among other things, gravity waves and so on. But really, the profile where Huygens uh, entered about here and descended was very nice on the spot. So congratulations, Manuel, again, for the great job. And you really helped us a lot to make Huygens so successful. Um, a few views uh, of um, a few images taken by Huygens at different altitudes. This is 50 kilometers, 30, this must be 10, 8, 1.5, and 0.3 kilometers in three dif uh, four different directions. So Huygens was spinning such that the camera could take uh, panoramas all around. So we, this is just a, a selection. So at 50 kilometers altitude, we are still through the haze. We start seeing the, the surface, but really the surface became very clear below about 40 kilometers. Uh, we eventually could uh, see nice river channels, and this was one of the first uh, <coughs> series of images or pictures with pictures uh, stick together, which shows uh, this nice network of, uh, <coughs> of rivers, uh, which is, uh, was, must be the one here. Yeah, here. So very, uh, very fascinating world, which we discovered, surface, which we discovered on the 14th of January 2005. Um, and this is one of the images of the surface which was taken once Huygens had landed. Um, <clears throat> so very, uh, very unique uh, <clears throat> surface. And those are um, blocks of ice, water ice. It's very cold on Titan. And um, they are on a sort of lake bed. Uh, and this is mostly sun sand-like uh, grain, a, a mixture probably of uh, water ice grains and organic grains. I think the, the composition of Titan surface at the Huygens landing site is still not very, very well understood. So this is surely an objective for the next mission. And those are measurement of the composition. The composition was, made, was measured regularly, of the composition of the atmosphere, and also of the aerosols, I mean, took Two layers of aerosol were sampled. I'm not showing the, the result here. So the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer measured regularly the uh, composition. So here at 120, 130 kilometers and on the surface. And we can see, because on the surface the instrument was still working, and we can see that the, the uh, mass spectrum, mass spectra, uh, uh, on the surface is much richer than the, the one in the, in the atmosphere. And <clears throat> this is, um, uh, again, the picture, one of the pictures taken after landing, and uh, some of the detail on the scales are indicated here. So the surface material is made of a mix of water, ice grain, and organic sand grains, and I think, as I said, the composition <coughs> is uh, not completely known. And there is strong, clearly strong evidence of erosion due to fluvial activity. So we landed in a, in a, in a sort of dry lake bed. But there was some erosion, uh, fluvial erosion uh, well before. Uh, Huygens also managed to, to probe uh, the depth of the <coughs> water layer of the ocean uh, behind, underneath the ice crust, which is about 100 kilometers thick, there was a, a nice experiment, uh, an electric field experiment, which detected the Schumann resonance in the atmosphere of Titan. Uh, Schumann resonance not excited by, sun, by the thunderstorm, because there are no thunderstorm on Titan, but due to the the, ex the excitation of all the Schumann low-frequency <coughs> resonances, which are well known in the Earth, uh, was due to the interaction of Titan with Saturn's uh, magnetic uh, uh, environment and the Saturn plus environment. So the analysis, detailed analysis of this uh, signal allowed to probe the depth of the ocean, which uh, was uh, found to be at a depth between 50 and 90 kilometers, I guess, from those measurements. 
uh, because we needed uh, for those uh, Schumann resonance, electromagnetic resonance to be present, we needed a second, uh, 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 the cavity of Titan, the upper layer is the ionospheric layer, and the bottom layer had to be conductive. And the surface is not conductive, so the conductivity of the, uh, surf of the surface of the ocean provided this second layer, which allowed to the Schumann resonance to, to, be, to be maintained and detected. Uh, on the future, so this is not exhaustive because there are uh, other studies which have been made or mission proposed, studies made of uh, future missions to Titan and also to Enceladus. Uh, so this is just uh, a few of them, and in fact myself I was involved in some of them, but clearly uh, for the future exploration or in situ exploration of Titan, we are going to float in balloon, to float on an ocean or uh, a large uh, hydrocarbon uh, sea, we are going to fly with a uh, plane or maybe other objects. So mobility in the air or on the, on the liquid uh, surface is going to be a strong driver for future missions. But it looks like the near future for Titan, which may, uh, may not be, uh, become true very soon, is a dragonfly mission. Uh, there was a nice poster about some of the science objectives for this mission. So the Dragonfly is one of the two uh, New Frontiers four finalists for NASA's decision in, in autumn. So this is, um, I mean, uh, sort of a very capable drone that will fly, land, and eventually sample the surface, analyze the sample and fly to another place and so on. So a very exciting mission, it's in competition with uh, another mission for a comet sample return, so uh, NASA's decision will be um, <coughs> known, I understand, in autumn, so I wish good luck to this uh, very exciting mission. So, I cannot speak about Huygens, but speaking on some of the issues, operational issues, and I like to, to, re to rephrase this. Uh, I took one of the sentences in, uh, in a nice paper, which is really summarizing um, you know, um, what the performance of Huygens, what went right, what went wrong, a paper by Ralph Lawrence, a retrospective and lessons for the future. I think it's really important to, to analyze this very carefully, how, we, how well we did, what did not so well. And the sentence I like is system behaviors that were not in accord with expectation. I think that's a nice way of putting it. Um, so one of the... Um, um, technical and operational issues we had is related to the radio transmission between uh, Huygens and Cassini. So on the Huygens, we had two radio transmitters. We were transmitting on two channels um, and receiving on two uh, receivers on board, on board Cassini. Um, one of the channels was properly driven by uh, normal crystal oscillators, uh, TCXOs. But the second channel, channel A in fact, was, could be driven by either a normal oscillator or an ultra-stable oscillator on the transmitting side and receiving side uh, to, um, <clears throat> to be able to measure the Doppler, uh, to have a, a, f a very um, stable frequency to measure the Doppler. And we, we really had a problem with that in the sense that the, the bandwidth of the receiver uh, was not, uh, was not uh, <clears throat> um, wide enough. So I'm summarizing this here. Uh, so we had two channels, channel B was okay, but channel A, the carrier, the subcarrier was were okay, but the, the bit sync clock at 16 kilohertz was a bit too narrow, and it was a question of PPM stability, uh, PPM uh, bandwidth, but it was too narrow, so the fault was revealed thanks to some carefully designed in-flight test before the Jupiter flyby, and it took a while, and we had to let Cassini do the Jupiter science to finalize our, our characterization, which uh, took uh, almost a year, and eventually we found a solution which involved significant changes in the Cassini-Huygens mission. Huygens was supposed to be released on the first orbit, it was delayed to the third orbit, and other changes as well, which are 
illustrated here. Um, I'm not going to go through all of that, but first of all, if we had not changed anything, so this is the signal to noise ratio, the, the uh, bandwidth of the receivers. If we had not changed anything, we would have been here in the blue zone, so we would have lost most of the data, if not all. So we managed by changing several things to put the signal into the white zone, which was a, well, the receivers uh, would perform uh, nominally, and this is what it did. So we, these changes, which involve a significant change of tra tra trajectory, not only released on the third orbit instead of the first, but also changes the flyby geometry. So we were supposed to fly this, we flew that, uh, was very successful, and we really managed to, to cope with a, a somewhat faulty uh, radio receiver. Uh, but we had another problem in that we, uh, we did not set properly, uh, this is an important issue, the receiver for the second channel, channel A, uh, but unfortunately we had set up this network of radio telescope which allowed us to recover <coughs> what we really lost, uh, the Doppler, because the Doppler was only possible through channel A uh, from uh, on the Cassini, uh, on the Huygens Cassini link. So we recovered nicely the Doppler uh, because we had uh, not switched on properly. So this was in the onboard sequence. We had not switched on properly the receiving part of the receiver. The transmitting part was fine. Uh, another story which is I'm still working on because this is not uh, very clear what happened. Um, so this is a targeting of, uh, of uh, Huygens on Titan's uh, atmosphere at 1270 kilometers, this was a targeting point. Uh, this is a descent, descent and velocity profile, that's fine. But what um, did not go right, or at, as Ralph would say, as a, a, in accordance with expectation, is that the, uh, pro, the Huygens probe should have spin in one direction, let's say in the positive direction, but it span in the opposite direction, which, some which had some consequences for the <clears throat> reconstruction of the panora uh, panorama, but uh, no other uh, significant consequence than that. So we are working on it, and this is, uh, this is a very tough uh, one because it, the aerodynamics of the Titan probe may not have been fully characterized, so we are running in a wind tunnel test, among other things, uh, a series of tests to try to understand exactly why Huygens was not spinning correctly. So this is ongoing work. Uh, a word on inter international collaboration. Cassini Huygens, so this was a combination of a NASA flagship and a NISA class M mission. And I like to recall that the mission had three fathers who were really friends, uh, Wingip, Daniel Gauthier, and Toby Owen. And they really worked very hard to, to get this mission proposed to ESA. I mean, Daniel Gauthier and Wingip proposed this mission to ESA in 1982. And of course, they, they, they knew that ESA would not be able to carry that mission by itself because ESA, for example, did not have a, a nuclear radioisotope capability which you need which you needed to go that far at the time and which you still need, more or less, to go beyond Saturn today. So they proposed to have this mission in collaboration with uh, NASA. And it took a while to study the mission, to put the collaboration in place, but eventually, thanks to, I think, what was a great ESA-NASA collaboration, despite all thanks to a uh, little trauma about the what became the Ulysses mission, which I will not go into the detail. So this was really a great collaboration. And eventually, HASI, the Italian Space Agency, became the third major partner. So what I think is important to remember about this collaboration, it was the payload on both elements, uh, the probe and the orbiter, were really shared among the various um, um, uh, communities and also the agencies and uh, national agencies in Europe paying for the payload. So this was a nice share, and of course, the science was really shared uh, about 50%. 50, 50%. One comment I, could, I want to say is that Huygens at some time was really very helpful in securing Cassini because there were some, as I would some, not say usual, but as it happened in the NASA system, there were some budgetary difficulties, and Huygens had two important 
uh, steps in the process in 92 and 94, I think has helped to secure the Cassini mission and to help uh, to explore Saturn and Titan for more than 30 years. So. Uh, this I'm going to skip because it's not, uh, I just wanted to say one more thing about the opportunity. The next uh, real opportunity for a, a significant, a similar collaboration at La Cassini-Huygens. In the previous slides, I had some examples of other type of collaboration and I was not exhaustive, I, I skipped that slide. But really the next great opportunity, I think, is the ice giant mission to Uranus and or Neptune. Again, ESA has some ambition, the European community has some ambition to explore Uranus and Neptune, but it has to be clear that we can't get there by ourselves. Europe does not have the capability to go to Uranus and Neptune. So, uh, a nice um, information was uh, provided to us on Monday. The new science, ESA science director really advertised this as a potential ESA-NASA collaboration. So this is, I think, great news. So this would be a NASA flagship to the outer planet, and is an M-class opportunity, which would need to be somewhat inserted into the current program, but the director of science was quite very positive about trying to do that and to facilitate what could become the next big collaboration. But we really need to develop science interests across all mission components to rally the largest European community, because it's important that for this mission to, to happen, I think, is that the, the whole European community will need to get behind and find a little or more than a little interest into that mission. And I'm borrowing a quote from Yves Langevin, who gave a very nice lecture for his, uh, his medal on Tuesday space science mission do not fall out of a tree. A lot of work would have to be done to make sure that this collaboration would eventually materialize. So this is a message I wanted to give. So back to Titan. So this is a, a nice uh, uh, map of the, Huygens, of the Titan surface made by the Huygens images, uh, and this has been reduced at 10 kilometers altitude, and um, here we go. Let's follow a nice um, video which has been put together by JPL, which summarizes the mission very nicely. Separation. Entry. What? and this one of the parachute.
So it took 20, almost 25 years from initial proposal to landing, but it was worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Pierre, for this nice talk. Um, so now it's your chance to ask uh, Jean-Pierre your questions, your comments. Yes, please. Please use the microphone. Thank you very much. Um, first, uh, apologies for the question. Uh, I work on Earth, so I don't know much about this. So maybe can you say some more words about uh, the distribution of liquids and solids on Titan? Because you were talking about dry riverbeds and, uh, and the water ice. But on the other hand, the future missions might be designed to land on an ocean. So what's the, what's the distribution here? Well, the, I think, Athena, you are going to address that uh, somewhat in your talk. But the, I mean, the, the big lakes um, distributed mostly on, in the northern high latitude. There are, there are a couple of lakes uh, in the southern uh, hemisphere, but the, the large lakes, which are 1,000 kilometers uh, in, um, in um, size, are mostly on the uh, high latitude, northern high latitude. Uh, the Huygens um, did not really uh, land in a liquid surface, although the surface at the Huygens landing site was wet, but we don't know, you know when Maybe it was due to rain, which had happened uh, years ago. We really don't know. Um, um, and the future missions, the Dragonfly, uh, I don't know, maybe there is someone who could uh, answer better than me, but the Dragonfly will land in the dunes uh, because the, the equator and the low latitude are covered with uh, dunes, big dune fields, and I think the, the, landing, the prime landing site will be in the dunes and will uh, move around. I don't think a uh, dragonfly, if it's ever selected, will have a chance to go to a, a northern lake, but who knows? So quite exciting to, to see uh, what a dragonfly uh, will do if selected. Okay. We have time um, for another question. Well, of course, this is an impressive presentation and impressive work. I would like also to highlight something that, as a high school student, I really enjoyed, which was this, that ESA gave all people the opportunity to send signatures on board a CD on Huygens. So thank you for uh, making that possible. Thank you. This was, this was a nice project. So thank you very much. I really appreciate this comment. Thank you. OK, thank you. I think we have to move to the next talk. And um, Athena uh, will show um, the result that Cassini obtained for the last, um, for the 13 years um, on Titan. Yeah, so good morning. Um, th thank you for the comment about us all uh, working on Earth, because we are all working on Earth. I mean, we're standing on Earth now. Um, and the planetary scientists are not all aliens. Um, I promise you, some of us know something about the planet Earth. Uh, the main things we find out about the planet Earth is actually by studying the objects that you just heard about. So I'm just going to try and follow up on um, uh, the two wonderful talks you just heard from uh, Linda and, and Jean-Pierre and complement a little bit what they said uh, about Titan. Titan is a, a wonderful object, and I'm going to show you how exciting it is to be working on it. Uh, you see here a picture of Titan with uh, the rings uh, on top and uh, Epimetheus up there. Uh, Titan has been uh, an object of curiosity for the scientific community for many, many years. Uh, since its discovery 363 years ago, actually, uh, by Christian Huygens. And I just wanted to highlight here uh, how important it was for us before we went there with space missions to have ground-based measurements on the one hand that actually hinted at the presence of an atmosphere around Titan, but also the Voyager missions on which we worked. And uh, Linda Spilker here was a pillar for the Voyager missions. And personally, I did my PhD on Voyager data. So we shouldn't forget that there was a mission actually before uh, Cassini. And that led to the Cassini mission. And this gives us hope that after the Cassini mission, we can get another one. Because every time we get a space mission, 
it actually creates more questions probably than we got answers. And this is why we want to go back, right? Um, but it's very important also to understand that um, the ground-based observatories and the measurements we get from the ground still today and also during the Cassini mission has helped us a lot to uh, uh, reveal all of these objects. And the, 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 the problem, the issue I'm going to be focusing in to complement what you heard before is the longevity of the Cassini mission. This is a mission that, as Jean-Pierre said, took 25 years from uh, idea to a final grand finale, and it revealed the Titan um, uh, satellite, the largest satellite around Saturn, second largest satellite in our own solar system, as an extremely complicated object. You can see here how complex Titan is. We put together <laughs> this diagram with Jonathan Lunin some time ago when we were discussing a future mission. And Jean-Pierre mentioned the nitrogen-based atmosphere. It has a wonderful organic chemistry inside there, and chemistry that uh, creates even prebiotic molecules that we find, uh, we detect uh, with measurements. And it also has a fantastic surface with a lot of features that we find on our own planet, on the Earth, all but made with uh, completely different materials. We find, for instance, as Jean-Pierre said, uh, uh, lakes, seas, dunes, I'll show you some of this stuff. But also this organic chemistry is something that we really want to pin down and see what is the degree of complexity uh, that the organic chemistry has achieved in the atmosphere. I'm going to be focusing on some of the evolution aspects that we see on Titan thanks to the Cassini mission, for instance, in Titan's atmosphere. And Titan revolves around uh, Saturn in uh, 15 days and 22 hours, and it's tidally locked, but also follows Saturn around the sun on a 30-year, 30, 30 terrestrial year period. So what you see actually here is one orbit, one full orbit of Titan on over 30 years. And you can see that the exploration we've had so far, uh, starting uh, here with the Cassini mission in 2004 and going all the way to the end that Linda showed before with the Cassini extended mission at the end, only covers two seasons on Titan. Each season is 7.5 years, and it's very important to understand that even with some of the ground-based measurements we have in the other two seasons here on Titan, we do not have a full picture. Uh, what we have so far is looking at the winter and spring in the northern hemisphere, and we find a lot of changes and a lot of evolution that have been observed in Titan's atmosphere thanks to actually different measurements that we were able to perform that the Voyager missions before or even the ground-based measurements do not allow us to have. For instance, one of the huge discoveries that we got with uh, Cassini was the detection of uh, very, very complex ions in the upper part of the atmosphere where the two mother molecules in Titan's atmosphere, molecular nitrogen and methane, interact with sunlight, energetic particles, and through <clears throat> dissociation and ionization processes, create these uh, ions, and this uh, comes down to the neutral part of the atmosphere where we detect with Cassini sears a whole host of hydrocarbons, nitriles, and some oxygen compounds that actually are not produced by photochemistry but come from the outside. All of this creates complex organics that falls down to the surface, and Jean-Pierre mentioned the, the large spectrum of components that uh, Huygens GCMS detected on Titan's surface. And all of this, uh, a manifestation, for instance, of the seasonal effects on Titan is here this detection of the southern uh, cloud that we saw already in 2012, and this already was a discovery that meant that the temperature in Titan's southern polar region was dropping very, very rapidly and very dramatically at that time. And this actually was found very, very um, detailed, in a very detailed analysis that we did, which showed that while the north polar region on Titan didn't show very, very large variations in temperature, only about five to 10 degrees K uh, added in uh, the time of 2013 to 2016, the northern polar region on Titan here going from 2012 to 2014 lost about 25K in temperature. This actually translated in variations of atmospheric composition near the poles. Here in red lines, you have the south pole. Black lines is the northern polar region. 
And in some cases, like for instance, for complex hydrocarbons and nitriles shown here, we had several orders of magnitude enhancement in the abundances of some of these components, in particular benzene, but also HCN and HC3N. There's a strong dramatic increase in the composition in the South Polar region of Titan. And only recently, since 2015, we've seen actually a drop in uh, the northern polar region on Titan, which means that Titan's atmosphere is extremely complex. And the fun thing about the Cassini mission is that it allows, allowed us to go back to the same season as we had actually observed with uh, the Voyager mission. Um, and this, of course, is in translation from Mac to PC um, that uh, created some problems in this part of the spectrum. But we saw that the enhancement that we had at the North Polar region at the time of the Voyager, November 9080, is similar to what we observe today, two seasons later in the South. Seasonal changes on Titan are very abrupt and very important. But of course, everybody has been looking at the images that we got about Titan surface, and Titan surface has proved to be a fantastic place to look at. This is um, a, a Put some images taken with the VIMS instrument aboard Cassini, put together in what you see near the equator, these dark regions here are essentially the dunes that uh, Jean-Pierre also mentioned. And up here at the poles, we have brighter terrain that I'll show you in a minute. Uh, the, the diversity on Titan's surface is extraordinary. For instance, we have found some craters, but not as much as we would have thought, which means that actually there are erosion processes, as Jean-Pierre mentioned, on Titan surface, and some of the craters that would have been expected to be there have been filled. There are dune fields, you can see them here, the longitudinal dune fields, composed essentially actually from small organic particles mixed with ice. Um, this is an ISS, this, uh, this is the Cassini images, and this is the VIMS uh, data showing actually mountains and mountains on Titan. Mountainous ranges raise up to about 3,000 meters, not more, because the terrain on Titan is not very viscous. But they're actually the manifestation, we think, of tectonic processes or subduction processes. And because we see some lava flows around the mountains in some cases, we have, we think, detected some uh, volcanic activity, cryovolcanic activity actually on Titan. And so Titan's surface may be uh, quite active. But one of the very important uh, areas, and that was one of the previous questions, is of course the lakes. Rivers and lakes have been detected on Titan. They're essentially located in the port North Polar re region. And for quite some time, we thought they might explain the missing methane reservoir because the amount of methane we have today on, in Titan's uh, atmosphere uh, is not something that we can explain by the processes, physical processes, uh, photo dissociation that we have in the atmosphere. The methane should have disappeared in something like 30 to 40 million years. It's still there. So there is a reservoir on the surface. Uh, it could have been the lakes, but actually the amount we've measured of liquid in the lakes doesn't correspond to what we need for the atmosphere, so we think there's a, probably a subsurface reservoir of methane on Titan. But the lakes that we see on Titan, some of them, very few of them, like Ontario Lacos, are located near the equator, and most of them are in the North Polar region, which we think is, uh, again, a seasonal effect and corresponds to the fact that the North Polar region is in the shadow and can hold on to this liquid that we find on the surface. Um, and this is Lake Giamara, the second largest uh, uh, lake on Titan in the northern polar region, where we find indication for drainage um, uh, channels. Uh, the shores are uh, very, very fractal-like. And we also saw evidence for something like a magic island uh, in 13 and uh, 14, something that appeared and then disappeared probably evidence for rising winds, um, creating waves in the lake, or other processes like bubbles and so on. So many interesting things happening on Titan with regard to the lakes, and one of them was the shrinking of the lake by 9 to 15 kilometers, actually, between 2005 and 2009, as observed both by the cameras and the radar. One of the lakes on Titan, the Ontario Lakes, near the equator, where the summer was coming on, actually shrank with time. So we can see that very many processes are uh, at work on Titan, and some of these lakes above them have 
clouds, and we want, we want to see if this is a connected phenomenon between uh, the lakes underneath, the liquid underneath, and the clouds that we see rising and uh, swirling above the northern lakes. Uh, this is just to show a, uh, the, the Huygens landing site, as was observed also with Vimsen and radar, and we were able to make some very nice analysis of the data. Uh, Sodrum Law uh, created a very nice model showing some of the hints at the composition of Titan's surface, thanks to the fact that we have all these combined observations. But as Jean-Pierre mentioned, we still don't know exactly what the surface composition on Titan is. What we think we know is that there are active regions on Titan, some places that show darkening and brightening with time. We also think we know uh, well that there's an undersurface liquid water ocean, that's the dark blue line that you see here. Uh, and there's also evidence for this undersurface liquid water ocean, as uh, Jean-Pierre mentioned from the Huygens measurements. But essentially, Titan spin uh, and the gravity measurements by Yes et al. in 2012 indicate the large tides uh, that we see on the surface argue again for this undersurface liquid water ocean. And this you've seen before. I just wanted to put up a drawing by Carl Sagan because I think anybody talking about Titan should pay credit to Carl Sagan, who's the uh, biggest fan of Titan even before we knew how complex and wonderful this world was. So Titan um, is a very complex uh, <coughs> body for the surface and the atmosphere. We have meteorological phenomena, a lot of geophysical uh, features on the surface that resemble what we have on the Earth, but they're made of different material. We have manifestations of um, evolution with time and seasonal effects, and undersurface liquid water ocean. With the organic chemistry, this causes us to think that indeed there's arguments for Titan being a habitable world, uh, at least from an astrophysical point of view. And it's actually one of the bodies uh, in the solar system and beyond, because this uh, refers also to exoplanets that we call water worlds, where we have a lot, massive amount of uh, liquid water possibly underneath the surface. 11 times more liquid water has been estimated at some point to possibly exist on Titan with respect to what we have on our own planet. So it's really worthwhile investigating this world. Uh, with space missions and ground-based measurements, in the case of Titan, our view has changed dramatically over the past uh, few decades. You can see here from the Voyager images, ground-based images with adaptive optics, uh, the Huygens landing site, and the map, full map we have today of Titan's surface. So it's really worth going um, back, and uh, Jean-Pierre mentioned all of this uh, uh, missions and the ideas that are not lacking. Actually, somebody uh, sitting here in the front uh, has actually suggested a submarine also to go in uh, Titan's lakes and, and explore the Titan lakes because this is a milieu we really want to uh, look at much closer than so far. So thank you very much and look at our session tomorrow, uh, PS 3.1, for more information on Titan, all the objects of the Cassini mission and the future missions. Thank you. Thank you, Athena. Any questions? Yes, please. Yeah, I have a perhaps naive question. Uh, ah, c'est triste. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on, on Earth, uh, generally, uh, in spring, uh, lakes uh, uh, grow uh, because of melting of glaciers. Uh, so it seems to be the reverse uh, that you observed. Uh, so how, how do you explain that? Yeah, th th this, this is uh, actually, uh, uh, the Ontario Lacus is a lake that is close to the equator. And so there we're moving, um, uh, we were in the summertime. And so we think this is an evaporation process. And at the same time, we monitor the lakes in the northern part, and those seem much more stable. We don't see any, uh, this kind of evolution, not, not shrinking in any way. So we think it's really seasonal phenomena. Yeah. So just, I would like to remind, this is a union session. That means that um, please don't be shy if your background is uh, from another field. Uh, <laughs> feel free to ask questions. Uh, if there's, is there anyone? No. Then, anyway, thank you, uh, Athena, very much. And um, <laughs> in the next talk.
will be by Nobert, on Saturn's magnetosphere after the end of Cassini. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, from Titan, we will go back now to the Saturnian magnetosphere and uh, what we learned from the Cassini mission about this second largest object in our solar system. So the picture we had before Cassini is uh, here on the left side, and it has not changed very much. There is only one big change, which uh, I think came uh, all about with the Cassini mission, so that Titan does not play any role, any major role in the Saturnian magnetosphere. It's only Enceladus, which is the major plasma source of, uh, of this large system. So there, um, the, the entire magnetosphere uh, is powered by the rotation of the planet, similar to Jupiter, so there's a, a fast rotation uh, of, of the planet of about 10 hours, and I'm going back to this because we don't know exactly the rotation rate, even after Cassini. And they have this, the plasma source essentially is the tiny little moon, 500 kilometers across only, uh, is Enceladus, which is providing nearly all the heavy ions in the, Jovian, uh, in the Saturnian magnetosphere. There is also some uh, very strong interaction between um, the, the charged particles in the magnetosphere and the rings and the satellites in the, in the system. And um, it is um, the case that there are much more neutrals available in the Saturnian magnetosphere compared to, outer, uh, to for example, Jupiter. So it's about 100 times more neutrals um, than ions in the Saturnian magnetosphere. So therefore, charge exchange plays a major role between the neutrals and the charged particles. Um, there are a few issues which um, we knew before, but also Cassini found out a little more details about this. So they are coming out of Enceladus, there's the water group ions, which are the dominant species in the magnetosphere. Um, there's also the funny case uh, that the dipole and the rotation axis are co-aligned with each other, and Linda mentioned the latest uh, number of 0.0. Oh, eight, I think, uh, between the, the dipole and the rotation axis. And in some aspects, therefore, um, Saturn's magnetosphere is, um, I think it's more Jupiter-like than Earth-like, but uh, some of the features uh, are more Earth-like as well. So um, in my talk, I will concentrate essentially on the charged particle measurements because this is my major field. But I will also show, of course, a little more about uh, what we have found in the, uh, in the final uh, Cassini data set. So essentially, um, we knew not very much about the inner magnetosphere inside the rings, and this is what the grand finale uh, added to the knowledge of the magnetosphere. We learned a lot about radial transport and uh, also um, variability in the <coughs> middle and the outer magnetosphere uh, of Saturn. So let's go for some of the major findings um, before the grand finale. And I'm starting off here with uh, the, we, we now have a radial profile of the essential plasma parameters in the Jovian, uh, sorry, Jovian and Saturnian magnetosphere. I keep on mixing these up. Uh, Saturnian magnetosphere. So we have now profiles uh, as a function of radial distance uh, of the velocity of the charged particles uh, during this fast rotation of the planet. Uh, Similarly to Jupiter, there is also a trend that uh, at some distance the strict uh, co-rotation velocity, which would be this dashed line, uh, is somehow broken and there is a co-rotation breakdown region um, uh, in the outer part of the magnetosphere. And this all goes together uh, by the, um, the sources and where the sources are located in the uh, Saturnian magnetosphere. So in the bottom uh, panel here you see the, the density of uh, essentially oxygen ions and a few other ions uh, also as a function of distance from the planet. And of course the maximum here for the water group ions is around Enceladus, which is then falling off uh, at higher distances. And this, all this material is of course coming out essentially as neutrals, is then uh, uh, changed into um, uh, charged particles and are uh, accelerated to uh, the energies we measure with the uh, particles and fields measurements on board Cassini. And this gives us then this radial profile, uh, essentially by looking uh, at the, the drifts of the charged particles uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field in, in the system. So this is very similar to Jupiter, for example. Another feature and finding is that um, some of those particles play uh, a, more, a, a major role, a more important role than we thought before, um, especially the, the heavy ions coming out of uh, the Enceladus plume. Uh, and this is uh, found out very nicely by, in these papers here by uh, Nick Serges, 
where he looked at the uh, particle pressure as a function of energy. So these are energy spectrograms as a function of, of pressure. And you see that uh, the, the heavy ions here, the oxygen plus ions, uh, are more important, for example, than the protons, and of course also for the electrons, as a function of energy. This is very important for modeling efforts and also for understanding the transport uh, in, in the system. In the lower panel here, you see um, the, the radial profiles of the total pressure of uh, low energy ions and energetic particles. Uh, and you see that from about eight to nine uh, Jovian, uh, Saturnian radii, they are about the same. So the energetic particles play a major role in that respect as well. Um, a, large, a big opportunity of Cassini was, of course, because um, the, the uh, mission duration that we could now tell a little more about seasonal variability and also about temporal variability of the uh, Saturnian system. And this is, uh, in, in this uh, 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 slide, you, you see um, that there is, for example, this warping angle. This is the angle of the incoming solar wind with respect to the location of the entire uh, dipole uh, is changing as a function of season uh, at Saturn. And if you plot this warping angle, then you notice that, of course, during the uh, decrease and the increase of this angle, uh, the plasma parameters changed a little bit. So uh, this is dedicated here. So this is uh, in 2007, and this is in 2009. These are um, particle spectrograms of protons, oxygen, and this is uh, 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 another uh, yeah, total energy is here. And you see that these changes here in the density are somehow related to these uh, distances and the warping angles during these orbits. So this is another thing which we can now look even in, in more detail to say more about the seasonal variability of the entire system. Another thing, as I mentioned before, is the temporal variability of the system and uh, how the, the particles are transported in, uh, um, in, in the entire large system. And on the left here, you see uh, some of the, for, for one orbit, you see um, uh, energy spectrograms for various ions as a function of the pitch angle. So this is the angle between the magnetic field and uh, the look direction of the sensor. Um, and uh, you see that they are essentially uh, changing as a function of time during the flybys, but there are these uh, dropouts in the magnetic field, which correspond to enhancements in some of those uh, energetic particles. And this is interpreted as uh, so-called flux tube interchange and injection events um, all the way through the uh, entire magnetosphere. And over these 258 orbits of Cassini, we are now able to have a map of those injections as a function of local time and also as a function of radial distance. And this is, of course, again, also combined by the fact that we have an energetic neutral uh, camera on board, the Inca camera. And this is this image, um, uh, or actually the movie, uh, looking down onto the system, onto the equatorial plane. And what you see here in color is the, the number of energetic neutral atoms which are produced in this charge exchange pro uh, processes uh, in the equatorial plane, in this ring current, and in the magneto disk region of the middle magnetosphere. And of course, when you have this movie, you can study the temporal variability from orbit to orbit, and you can uh, uh, get uh, a lot of information out of this uh, from looking at those. So these flux tube interchange uh, is then put into context of uh, uh, modeling efforts, and this is uh, very similar to what has been uh, thought of for the Jovian system, that um, some of those uh, low energy um, particles are transported outward in this finger-like structure, and this is what we see as these enhancements in the low energy ions. At the same time, there's also plasma um, injected from the outer part of the magnetosphere, hot plasma injected into the inner part. So this is an interchange and injection uh, motion, uh, which uh, is uh, sort of guiding the entire particle transport and dynamics of the Saturnian magnetosphere. So if you go further out in the magnetotail region of Saturn, there is also um, very similar, again, to uh, Jupiter, there is the, the effect of how is the plasma lost in the magnetosphere. And one of the major processes of loss mechanisms in the, in the magnetosphere of this 100 to 300 kilograms of material produced in the Enceladus uh, plume 
uh, has to be somehow going out of the magnetosphere. And one of the major processes is uh, magnetic reconnection and plasmoid releases. Um, and for Cassini, uh, especially in the uh, phase where all the orbits were in the equatorial phase going into the magneto tail, um, we found about 69 plasmoids and 17 so-called traveling um, corrotation regions and 13 planet moving events uh, in uh, Katrina Jackman's paper. They are very much um, summarized in this. So this is um, not all of them. We expected more to have, so we expected to see maybe every day or every rotation to see that. But of course, this is um, biased by the fact where Cassini was and how long it stayed in, the, in, the, uh, in this region. Uh, another finding is that the, the entire system is uh, periodically changing a lot. And uh, as I mentioned before, um, we have different um, periods found in the system. There's uh, 60, uh, 26, and 13 days, which might have something to do with the solar rotation rate. And uh, if you were in the session yesterday about um, the variability of the uh, Saturnian radiation belts, um, there is some evidence that there's a lot of Saturnian um, ICMEs arriving at Saturn uh, at the face of the um, uh, uh, solar um, periodicity of 26 days. But of course the major rotation rate we found in the system is the planetary rotation period and as a proxy we looked at the so-called Saturn kilometric radiation similar to Jupiter where we thought we could find out the rotation rate of the planet itself. But it turned out that this period uh, is not stable as a function of time as it is uh, shown here. And there are actually two periods at a time. There's one coming from the southern hemisphere, one coming from the northern hemisphere with slightly different periods. And they change as a function of seasons in the Saturnian system, merge, and then somehow come together and stay together and are not really separating after equinox anymore. So uh, this tells us that we don't know exactly the rotation rate of Saturn yet. There is still some hope, and especially for the grand finale orbits, as Linda pointed out, the magnetic field team is working very hard in trying to find out um, the, the rotation rate, but so far I haven't heard that they uh, are successful in this. Uh, anyway, and then we have other uh, periodicities in the charged particles, which gives us um, a hint of where the particles are accelerated. For example, there is a, a large number of one-hour modulations in particle and fields data. Um, Let's go to the discoveries of the mission a little bit before the grand finale. And uh, we found, for example, uh, new dust ring arcs by looking at the charged particle uh, absorption uh, 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 distribution there. So those particles we, we measure in the charged particle uh, instrument is that they bounce along the magnetic field lines. And if there's something in their way, they are lost on this body. And we found in this particular orbit, we found that uh, some of the particles are lost in specific locations. And we talked to the imaging guys and they looked back and they found that uh, there are these so-called anti and methony ring arcs, um, which they didn't know about before. So this is uh, another discovery of, um, of Cassini. Um, a very important one as well is that we looked at the locations of where ex we expect some absorptions from the smaller moons in the system, um, and we found out that sometimes those absorption signatures are not at the place where we expect them to see, but there is an offset, and this offset is a function of local time in the system from which we could arise um, an additional electric field present in the system which is very important in order to understand the entire transport mechanisms in, uh, the, Jovian, uh, in the Saturnian system. And uh, Ginger, Cha, and Margie Kibbelsen found uh, the theoretical interpretation of this, that there is an essentially um, uh, dust to dawn uh, uh, flow of those particles, which creates an electric field in the noon midnight orientation. So this is very important uh, to understand theoretically what the system is all about. So finally, um, some of those findings in the grand finale. So there was evidence that there is an additional radiation belt between, uh, in the gap between the uh, Saturn atmosphere and the D-ring remotely. So I told you before that we had this um, uh, remote sensing instru instruments by looking at uh, uh, not charged particles but at uh, neutral particles from that region. And during the insertion orbit of of Saturn, we had the possibility to look into this direction and found evidence that there is some emission coming from a belt inside the D-ring. 
So we, of course, this was one of the major targets uh, of the uh, grand finale orbits. You saw that before. Uh, so we looked at all these proximal orbits uh, in the final phase of the mission, and we found at nearly every uh, of those orbits, we found evidence of this, of this uh, emission, uh, from which we derived that there has to be an additional uh, ion radiation belt, low energy uh, ion belt uh, in this region. And this is what we measured when we flew um, for one of those orbits um, uh, along essentially the field lines in the northern hemisphere, connecting us first with the radiation belts, then above the main rings, where they're essentially uh, all particles are lost and we are seeing only background. And then we went into this region uh, of the D ring and unexpectedly we saw a very high peak here, so which means there are less particles available in this region. Um, and there are, there are even, uh, even particles available in this region which are, have much higher energies than we expected to measure in this region before. You saw that from Linda's presentation, so that's the final um, yeah, interpretation of our data that um, besides these gaps which are caused by the moons itself, as Linda pointed out already, uh, over the, the main rings, the A to C rings, there are essentially no energetic particles left. They're all lost on it. But inside, um, between the, the uh, 1,800 kilometers, uh, which was the very closest, the closest approach of all the proximal orbits, and the D ring, there exists um, a particle distribution uh, which is uh, new and is a new discovery that there are also MEV ions present in that uh, particular region. Um, so, finally, I think I'll leave you with this. That is the mission completed picture of the Saturnian radiation belts. So we saw, uh, these are real measured data from one of the particle instruments on board. So we saw these gaps here in between where the moons are located. Uh, and then with the grand finale, we added this, which is zoomed out in this uh, insert here. Um, and the funny thing is that they are bounded, these, these radiation belt I was mentioning before, are bounded by features in the D-ring, which are these ringlets, the D68 and the D73 ringlets, and uh, this gives us um, a large opportunity to study this interaction of uh, galactic cosmic rays, because this is the, the, essentially the source of these innermost particles in the MEV range, and uh, the rest of the magnetosphere, and uh, I think Cassini provided us a lot of information and there's a lot of things which we have to do in the next few years. So the science papers and the JL special issues is, is just the first glimpse of, of data which we are going to um, analyze in a couple of years from now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Norbert. Um, we are actually um, over time in the coffee break, but um, please, if there's a question, feel free to ask. If not, um, I'll remind you the second part of the session will continue after the coffee break uh, at the same room here. Thank you. Let's go ahead and get the session started. If everyone could please take their seats. This is the second part of Cassini and future perspectives for the exploration of the outer solar system. Welcome to this session. Uh, what we're going to do is a little bit different. We're going to give each speaker 15 minutes with three minutes for questions at the end. We had a discussion period. We've decided to break it up instead and have questions after uh, each speaker. Uh, so our first speaker is uh, Hunter Waite. He's going to be talking about the coupling of Saturn's atmosphere and ionosphere to the rings. Hunter? Uh, thank you, Linda. Um, so back in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, when I was a graduate student, I had the um, good fortune of modeling the upper atmosphere and ionosphere of Saturn. And uh, that was before Voyager, excuse me, Pioneer and Voyager flew by and measured, made measurements of the ionosphere. All, all our models were wrong. Uh, Jack Knerney came to my rescue and we came up with, uh, he came up with an idea that maybe there was material from the rings that was responsible for modifying the upper atmosphere. And um, we didn't at the time, and so there's been subsequent measurements ground-based that support this kind of idea, but I don't think anybody had any idea that it was gonna be 
quite as interesting as we found out. So with that, let me go to the next slide. Left, you say? Okay. So I'm going to start off talking a little bit about the instrument and the overall view of the neutral and ion measurements, and then I'll go into some details. So this is the uh, ion neutral mass spectrometer. It has two different ways for material to enter the instrument. One is the closed source antechamber. So gas comes in, it bounces around, thermalizes on the walls. Um, in this case, the gas was tra traveling at 31 kilometers per second. So things happen when you hit molecules hit walls at 31 kilometers per second. Keep that in mind as we go through this talk. Uh, the second way the, was this open source. In this case, the material that we were measuring was actually the ion component. It never touched the walls. And, but uh, INMS was never designed for this particular endeavor. Uh, that high velocity uh, made it such that only very light mo molecules or light particles could actually make the turn and be detected. The other ones bounced into the walls, and that'll become obvious a little bit later. Okay, this is a typical profile of, of the lowest altitude, and I'll concentrate um, on this region, this grand finale phase that where we were making measurements always inside the D-rings, in between the D-ring and the atmosphere. There's three different levels that uh, were discussed earlier by Linda. This is a profile showing H2 as you go in, and it, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. All of these orbits are quite similar, so the lowest altitude at which we are making the measurements and the highest density is not at the equator, it's south of the equator, about, in this case, six degrees south of the equator. That turns out to be fortuitous, and it helps us determine what's happening in the atmosphere and what's happening in the rings and separate the two. Also keep in mind that as we go uh, from high latitudes through the equator to low latitudes, we're also changing dramatically in altitude, which is shown by that black line. So there's a correlation between latitude and altitude in, in the things that I'll show. This is a, a summary of the four passes where we were able to make ionospheric observations. Uh, the black lines show the light ions that we measured. In this case, it would be H+, plus, H2+, plus, and H3+, plus that we were able to measure. And the uh, other measurements, which you can see in the blue and the red, our RPWS determinations of the electron density. And you can see in the upper two panels, were, which were taken at higher altitudes, there's an agreement between the electron densities and the light ions, and in the lower atmosphere, there's not. And I'll come back to that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about atmospheric structure. This uh, shows, these are small plots, I know, but it gives you an overall view of all the data that we obtained on these uh, proximal orbits. Uh, where we had good pointing with INMS. And so it's divided into the regions where the high altitudes, the middle altitudes, and the low altitudes, and finally the final plunge. And you can see the H2 is in green, and HD plus um, the isotope of helium um, is um, in the yellow. The kind of chartreuse color is actually uh, the main helium component isotope. And you can see that on, we only saw significant amounts of the other two gases at the lower altitudes. And you can see quite a bit of structure and variation. Now, one of the interesting things, this is just shows, at least on the lowest altitude passes, it shows the mixing ratios for some of these major constituents. In this particular case, we're trying to illustrate what the HD looked like and the helium looked like in terms of mixing ratios. And you can see the helium looks pretty much constant. There's some variabilities coming from the atmosphere. In the case of the HD, there's the final plunge, which is in the orange, is significantly different than the other passes. And that's because that was at a different latitude. And so what this tells us is that there's inflow of H2 from the rings and HD from the rings, and that is actually higher, has a higher H to D ratio. It's got an H to D ratio that's Earth-like or maybe cometary-like. 
coming from the, that material coming from the ring plane. We're also in the process of um, using the HE da data and extrapolating it downward so that we can determine the mixing ratio in the lo lower atmosphere for H2 to HE. And our preliminary results, which are, they are preliminary, indicate that the uh, measurements are much more like, in this case, the ratio is much more like Jupiter than was expected. There was expected to be a rain out and a decrease in the helium abundance, and we're not finding that. All right. Whoops. There it is. Okay. Now, I'll get into the uh, most interesting aspect of this, which is the uh, material that's coming from the rings and what it's doing to the atmosphere and ionosphere. This is a plot that shows, in this particular case, it's the magical mass 28, which because of the low resolution, our mass spectrometer remains undetermined in almost every place in the Saturn system. It can be N2, it can be CO, or it can be C2H4, and we choose what's appropriate during the for, for each talk. But no, uh, nonetheless, we don't really know exactly what the constituent is, but we can tell in this case, and you can see from the contour plot, this material is coming straight in from the ring planes. So it's representative a volatile material that's coming in from the ring plane. And to one of the major constituents that we were able to determine as a gas that's coming out from the ring plane was completely unexpected. We expected water to be the major constituent. This is methane. And methane was the major volatile that we could see coming in from the ring plane and dispersing into the equatorial atmosphere, falling into the equatorial atmosphere. We expected that the methane in this atmosphere was going to be confined because of turbulent processes coming up from the interior to fairly deep in the atmosphere, but since it was coming from the rings, we saw methane very high up in the atmosphere. And you can see from the different passes, and these are the, all the low altitude passes, that there's quite a huge variation in the mixing ratios that we saw. So there's a, depending on which orbit, which flyby we were looking at, there's a very different ratio. Now, we tried to understand, uh, first of all, we don't really un understand exactly how we're getting CH4 from the rings. And we also tried to understand the variability. And so we actually took a look, uh, well, Matt Hedman gave us data of, uh, this is, the black lines indicate the uh, I over F or the reflectance in this D68 ringlet, a piece of the, uh, of the D ring, where it brightened just a few years ago. And you can see that there's a slight correlation that we're, we're trying to understand where this material may have been generated from some kind of earlier collisional process and that the, our methane mixing ratios somewhat correlate with that. Still an ongoing question. One of the more interesting aspects uh, that was shown earlier by Linda it was, is this very, very complex spectrum that we saw. So there's, our, our biggest problem was to try to figure out what is volatile material that came into our instrument, meaning volatile gases like CH4, water, we think we saw um, ammonia, and CO2 as volatiles. The rest of this material comes from impact processes of bigger grains that Linda also mentioned. That, and that, let me go through that and explain that just a little bit. So this is actually uh, data now from the MIMI investigation that shows as a function of latitude, the counts per second for, the, for their particular instrument. So these, these are uh, particles that are very large. They're about 10,000 to 40,000 U, these particles that are being counted here. And there's a little break where the high voltage drops that uh, where there was a deflection that was going on to keep the ions from coming in as opposed to the neutrals. And that allowed them to actually determine the percentage, which is down at the bottom here in this red trace, of how much material was neutral versus how much material was ions. But they were measuring these very large particles and these very large nano, well, very large from our point of view, uh, these nanograins are what we think are responsible for these breakup products that we see inside our instrument. That, uh, if we analyze that material, 
this is the kind of uh, numbers that we get of the material that we saw in the spectrum. So we see the volatile CH4. We see something at mass 28. Could be a breakup product of CO2, maybe a breakup product of something else. Can be C2H4. We also see water. We see a whole host of what we call organics. They're, most, they're best described by uh, alkane type materials, so just standard hydrocarbons is the best fit. But you have to realize this is a very complex spectrum. It's fragmented by the impact, and uh, we have low resolution mass spectrometry. So we're, we're just, these are just suggestions of what the material looks like. There's also ammonia, and there is some indication of sulfur species too at a low concentration. All right, the other very interesting aspect of this is what this material does when it interacts with the ionosphere. Uh, in the case of, in the, in the case of uh, the, what we expect in the ionosphere is if you have protons, they recombine with electrons very slowly through a radiating process. So we expected, if you didn't have an atmosphere that was carrying on a lot of chemistry, there would be mainly protons in this at ionosphere. But that is not the case at all. And so this is work that Luke Moore has done on the modeling. Uh, he took our neutral atmosphere models in a couple of cases for P288 and P292, two of the passes. And this gives the kind of mixing ratios of volatile species he was looking at. So he was trying to see if this inflowing material, how that would influence the, chemist, the ion neutral chemistry in the upper atmosphere. He ran, since we don't know what the mass 28 is, he ran several different cases, assuming into CO, C2H4. And you can see it creates very complex uh, ionospheric ions uh, composition. In the N2, you get things like N2H+, HCO2+, and CH5+. If you have CO incoming, you get HCO+. And if it's C2H4, you get HCO2 plus and hydrocarbon ions. So you can get different scenarios but based on what your um, assumptions are about the mass 28 constituent. But it, this is the, the bottom line is that this is a much more complex ionosphere than we had anticipated. And from the inflow of the material, this complexity is pretty much confined to the equatorial region of the ionosphere, which should make for some interesting dynamics we've, which we have not yet been able to investigate. Just to show you uh, how, what that does, this is, again, the, the total electron density is shown as that black trace that in NE, the, the electrons. You can see the H3 plus we measured is in the blue, and the gray is the H plus. And this is, in, you can see that the H3 plus and the H plus lie below the electron. So there's some other molecular ion that's the key ion in this particular case. But you can see that his agreement, Matt, uh, Luke's agreement with the ionospheric density or the measured constituents are not particularly bad for H plus. They are not as good for H3 plus, so we certainly don't completely understand the chemistry yet, but, we, but we've, we're making good progress in that regard. Okay, so um, near the end, um, one of the things I, I've talked about the complexity. One of the interesting things to note and that will be presented further in Mark Perry's talk tomorrow, one of the questions is how much material is really coming into the upper atmosphere? And um, that, that's a little bit complicated because we measure the densities pretty well, but we have to assume the downward flow velocities to get the flux of material in. And we have to assume, we've only measured in the day side near noon. So we have to be able to try to understand what's happening at other uh, local times and so forth. But our estimates indicate there's maybe up to 10,000 kilograms per second of material coming in, and that's a huge amount of material. It's, the C ring would be, the D ring would be gone in no time if this 
or to persist over a long period of time. So we would suggest that this is probably a fairly, this is a transient event. There, there may be other magnitudes of events that occur all the time, but this is a very large amount of material that we have to verify. And if it's true, it's quickly degrading the D-ring right now. <laughs> so with that, I'll end. Thank you. Thanks, Hunter. This paper is now open for questions. Please use a mic. So, Hunter, thanks very much. INMS is one of the most important instruments I feel, you know, although I'm not from the field on Cassini. If we were to go back in the Saturnian system and do not just Saturn, but also Titan and Enceladus, on which INMS had major discoveries, what would you change to improve the instrument to get us the higher level of information we would require? Oh, that's a very good question. So part of, uh, one of the, the first answer is mass resolution and mass range. We could go up only up to 100 U. That turned out um, to be something that limited us both in Enceladus, Titan, and now in this particular case. So mass range and mass resolution. The mass resolution, 28 is the perfect example, right? We would know if it was C2H4, CO, or N2 with just a little bit better improved mass resolution. So those are the two key things. Uh, some of these atmospheres are pretty, um, they don't have a very high density like the, the plume. So other means of concentrating the material so that you can make the measurement would be the third thing on the list. Great. Any other questions? I had a quick one, Hunter. How do you make sure that what you're seeing, this beautiful complex spectrum, that it's not residue from Titan or Enceladus? Or do you have clues that, that this really is unique material? Yes, um, we do because we, well, it's not, a, there's two or three different lines of evidence. The first line of evidence is in, when we're doing the F ring, the grazing orbits, we had gr grain material that was coming in and that would have sandblasted the interior of the instrument and knocked off Titan residue, we didn't, we didn't see it. That's the first thing. The second is, there's so much material here <laughs> that we could not have collected enough on all the Titan passes we did to, make, to, to be responsible for what we see. Okay. So that's another good way of saying this is real. But in the third thing, which makes us feel most comfortable, is Mimi saw the same material, and we're just seeing the breakup products of the same types of things they saw. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Hunter. Next, highlights of Saturn's icy satellites after the Cassini mission, and the talk will be given by Bonnie Brody. Thank you so much, Linda. First of all, I really want to make sure that uh, everybody understands that I'm talking for a very large team, uh, a tremendous team that did great work. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, I'm only going to be able to um, talk about... Oh, it's not working. I press it to go forward. I, I did it, it doesn't, it's not doing it. Oh, scroll? Oh, there, okay, okay. Uh, first of all, just a little review of, of the moons that I'll be talking about. I'm not gonna be talking about Titan, that was a, a previous thing. Um, I'm gonna be talking mainly about things that happened during the last year of the mission uh, with the major results thrown in. We had a great view of uh, the ring moons at the end. And I wanna start out by telling you the questions we haven't answered, rather than giving those at the end. We've made a lot of inroads in the composition, but still don't know basic things like, uh, is ammonia or ammonia hydrate there? We're not sure about the variability of the activity on Enceladus. We don't even know if Enceladus is currently uh, the only active moon. We are also kind of um, very impressed by the importance of magnetospheric interactions and ring interactions on determining the optical and uh, spectroscopic properties of the moons. And the, the big question here is why are the Jovian and Saturnian system, the, the moon system, so different? Jupiter's like a little solar system, but the Saturnian system is basically stochastic. There are a lot of um, kind of random events that have led to its evolution. And finally, we were interested in how extensive are the habitable zones in the system. Okay. So I want to start out with this bonus that we got even before we entered into Saturn orbit insertion, Phoebe, 
which is probably a captured Kuiper belt object. The composition was different than what we expected. It was kind of uh, formed in a cold part of the solar system, and it was, it was quite heavy for a Saturnian satellite, 1.7 grams per cc. So we uh, figured, this paper by Johnson and Lunin, that it was a captured Kuiper belt object. And then I, uh, an, IS, an imaging science team led by Tillman Dank is currently reducing some of these other outer uh, moons, these outer irregular moons, which were probably captured objects. And he sub submitted a paper to the GRL special issue that have very unusual dynamical properties. OK, so here's, I think, one of the greatest discoveries of this mission, and that is that, for, for the moons anyway, and that is that uh, Dale Cruikshank and his team, looking at many, many uh, images, have discovered complex hydrocarbons, these aliphatic and um, pause, the uh, polycyclic polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons on, on Iapetus. This is part of the, this elusive low albedo material in the outer solar system that we believe ultimately moves in the inner solar system to form the prebiotic uh, um, molecules from which life arose. And I, up there in the upper left, I also have this little uh, image that we serendipitous, serendipitously got on January 1st, uh, New Year's Day of 2005, of this walnut ridge, which may be a collapsed ring on the surface of Iapetus. Okay. Oops. Now I. Oh. Yeah, I went. I went for. Well, okay, I'll just. I'll just say what the uh, one that I skipped was. Um, oh, there it is. Okay. So uh, one of the other things is the, the discovery of carbon dioxide on practically all of these moons. We haven't found them on the inner moons, but the main moons. Here's a, here's a, a nice Clark that Roger, uh, a nice Clark, a nice uh, view, view graph that Roger Clark put together showing that little black line shows the carbon dioxide that exists in practically all of these satellites. Is the darker they get, the more prominent it is. Okay, let's see if I can do this right. There's some little touch there that my, there, okay. So um, here's another image, another graph uh, that Roger Clark put together. And it's kind of complicated, but I only want you to focus on that little green circle. I mean, it shows all this water ice. I mean, it's mainly water ice, the, these moons and various red contaminates. But one thing we haven't resolved was whether or not ammonia hydrate exists on any of the uh, surfaces of these bodies. This is an important molecule because it was supposed to provide antifreeze for some of the activities. Also, um, Josh Emery and Ann Verbisher have had a tentative a detection from ground, but there I put a little green circle over the possible absorption band of um, ammonia. You can see it's pretty, pretty weak and we're really uncertain. So that's one of the unknowns of the uh, project. There. We did solve one mystery. In fact, it has to do with this ammonia. Voyager showed all these bright, wispy streaks on the surfaces. They were both on the trailing side of Rhea and Dione. And we thought that these were kind of extrusions of water, a slurry of water that was being um, a kind of a softened up by ammonia. And the Voyager, uh, the Cassini images showed something completely different. They showed a series of cliffs and uh, faults that just if the light hit right, made them appear to be bright. So that's, that's one of the mysteries that, that we did solve. And ammonia looks like it was not involved. Okay. There, okay. Uh, one of the other great discoveries of the mission was of course the plume on Enceladus showing active cryovolcanism uh, the uh, next to Io is the most active body in the Earth, of course, in the solar system. Uh, here on the left is a little graph that Carolyn Porco and her colleagues put together showing that there are about 100, uh, over 100 jets that comprise this plume. And she was actually able to connect these to some of the hot spots that Sears had been mapping. And then there's another, there's some of the other work that uh, Joe Spitali had done that showed you could actually get the illusion of a jet if you folded these curtains of, of water ice that were coming out in the right way. Okay, let's see if I can. Oh, there, okay. Uh, another 
discovery of the, the jet was that, and this was done by uh, Vims and, and Matt Hedman and his team, that in fact the jet is four times as bright when it's at apoapsis, the farthest from Saturn. So there on the right, that's apoapsis. Oh, no, I'm sorry, the left, the left is apoapsis. And you can see that it's about, let's see, yeah, you're seeing the same way I do, okay. It's four times as bright as when it's closest, which is periapse. Now this, of course, can be explained by having the fissures that are the source of the plumes, these tiger stripes in the southern pole of Enceladus, they get squeezed together by tidal forces when the moon is closest to Saturn. And the other thing that we haven't quite figured out is what the seasonal and long-term changes are on these plumes. We can't quite agree on that, but we're, we have a lot of data throughout the mission and we're looking at it. And here's a, uh, actually this is a Cassini nugget that I, NASA likes our teams to produce these nuggets. And here was one that pretty much summarizes our view of the global ocean inside Enceladus. Uh, one of the things that Peter Thomas did was that he explained the magnitude, and his team, uh, explained the magnitude of the moon's libration. It requires that the shell be actually decoupled from the interior. So the magnitude of that libration implied that there is a global ocean there. And that further implies that more heat would be generated inside Enceladus than previously thought. This is good because the tidal heating couldn't really explain everything. And then also, of course, you know, I, there's so little time, don't have time to mention anything, but, uh, or, or, or much at all, mentioned mention something, but there are hydrothermal jets, or, or um, not jets, but um, uh, thermal um, smokers, they're called, where these, um, this uh, hot material is uh, moved from the, the um, mantle of Enceladus into this ocean, and this is believed to be uh, where the habitable environment may be. Uh, there's also evidence that there's a methane source in the ocean. Uh, there's also, I think in the next slide here, yeah, this is some of Hunter Waite's uh, work looking at the results from INMS, and it shows that there are organics in that plume. There's mainly uh, methane and water vapor, but there's simple organics, a carbon monoxide, and complex organics. And so all the background for life for having a habitable environment is there. There's liquid water, there's these thermal vents which provide the heat, and then there are organic materials. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so another one of the, this is kind of a, almost a, an excitement but a disappointment of the mission, and that is that we had evidence for activity on Dione, that it too might be an active world, but some kind of lower level of volcanic action. However, looking at, you know, gathering lots of data and looking at it in detail, we did not confirm this. Let me just go over some of the evidence. Uh, Paul Shank uh, pointed out that um, there was a, let's see if I, oh yeah, I can't get, no, I can't get this working. There, okay. He pointed out that there was this, right in the middle here, I think that's the leading side, shows these features, right, right smack in the middle, that are not impact craters, they appear to be cryovolcanoes. And furthermore, they're surrounded, can I get that up again? Oh, damn. I need to go to previous. I'm sorry, my, my hands are not, yeah, okay. Uh, they're not the young hands of so many of you people. Um, so here's the, uh, yes, I have it. So, so there is the, um, the features that are believed to be cryovolcanoes. Cryovolcan and not only, you'll notice also there's a rampart crater there to the left. They seem to be centered in the middle of what looks like the smooth plain that may have been um, volcanic deposits of some sort. You can also see there's all, you know, all around the whole sphere are these features that look like um, fossilized target, tiger stripes, similar to the features that we saw on Enceladus. So really, it, it's really, Tantalized. And here on the right, I show this image from Roger Clark that showed kind of an aura or a atmosphere around, active, around, around um, Dione. We also have the case of Tethys, where Paul Shank had discovered these mysterious red streaks. And they look like they're painted on the surface. They're of unknown origin. Here's a 
VIMS ratio spectrum that shows the ratio of the red streaks to the reference region. And in places where organic should be high, like here, okay, and, and there, in the, in the three micron and the five micron region, it looks higher. So it looks like there might be some organic stuff being exuded from these cracks, but you know, this could be a particle size effect. This is all ongoing work. We're really not sure of the answers, but Tethys also looks like, you know, there may have been some kind of outgassing there at these mysterious streaks. But data taken throughout the mission, and I think one of the key pieces of evidence here was uh, the occultation work done by Candy Hansen, who basically, whenever a star went behind uh, Tethys or Dione, she was taking data on, on Uvis, and I think she got 10 occultations of Dione, about three of Tethys, and she saw nothing. Her team, this is something that she published in uh, LPSC this, this year. It just shows no evidence of an atmosphere. And here's some VIMS high phase angle measurements of Dione. Now, if you look at the, I, I show Enceladus there for comparison. This red stuff here, that's the, the peak of the Enceladus plume. It really is forward scattered. So this, is, this goes from zero degrees to 180. It's new moon, or rather full moon to new moon. So that plume really, really shines at high phase angles. This dot here, this circle here, is uh, one for Dione. There's no evidence that Dione has similar forward scattering. Okay, and the other thing about these moons is that their optical properties are determined by fallout from the rings and also from high energy particles. Here's an example of Mimas and Tethys. This is work that Carly Howitt done, sh showing that high energy electrons alter the um, thermal response of the surface and call these, uh, cause these uh, things that we've nicknamed Pac-Men. Okay, these are little features uh, caused by these high energy electrons altering the thermal inertia. And again, plume deposits galore on the surface of Enceladus. Okay, so I did want to, let me see if I can move this. Can you, yeah, okay. So at, at the end of the mission, we had what was basically a whole new mission of five fabulous flybys of the ring moons during the F ring orbits. And there's a paper that is, has been submitted to science on the results of this. Here you can see them listed. Um, we also got a flyby of Epimetheus that isn't the best one, but it was one at 10,000 kilometers, kilometers, which is pretty good. So here is, um, if I can go to the next one. I just can't, no, I just can't. Could you move it for me? I just can't do it. Yeah, so here's an example. This is one of the so-called, um, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm out of time. So this, this is the uh, so-called, this is um, one of the so-called uh, shepherd moons, and you can see we got data in ISS, imaging VIMS and ATLAS. The next one shows pan, which is extremely red. That, that's the thing. You know, you know, here's pan embedded in the rings, and we got a visible spectrum for the first time. It's red. Go on to the next one. I'm going to finish up here. You can see that, um, okay, so here's Enceladus. This is just a color slope, so red is in this direction. It's up and to the right. Here's Enceladus, the minor moons, and here, here is the ring, showing that as the moon gets closer into the ring, the, the embedded ones, this is really true of, they're red, showing that they're all contaminated by the ring. And here are the next, here, here are my uh, main conclusions. So uh, basically, uh, we've discovered CO2, it's, it's ubiquitous. Ocean worlds are rampant, and I haven't even mentioned Titan. Exogenous alteration processes determine the, the properties of the surfaces. And finally, I just wanted to mention that, um, again, to reiterate, this is not the mini solar system that we see in, in Jupiter. This is something that has been formed by impacts and all sorts of um, disruptions. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. I, I sympathize on how difficult it is to cover all the icy moons and all the different aspects we're trying to show you today from the Cassini mission. Um, questions for Bonnie on the icy moons? So looking at your conclusions um, about the, the ocean worlds in particular and about the distribution of the organic material, 
among the moons. It seems that we do find some common threads among some of these moons, uh, the way they are contaminated, the interior structure, and so on. So I'm guessing you're still working on all of that, but do you see different groups among the moons that we would have in the Saturnian system? Yeah, I see, I see the, uh, I'm just thinking about certainty and uncertainty. I mean, Titan and, and Enceladus, clearly they have habitable environments. I think with Dione, it's um, a little, it, there probably is some kind of an ocean there, but whether it's global or not, Rhea, I, you know, I don't think so. Tethys is just, it's, it's only got a density of like less than one, so I think that's hard. So I think we go from certain to uncertainty. I think that's how, how I would yeah. characterize them. Yeah. So you want to go back to, right? Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Here's a question. Kelsey Singer, Southwest Research Institute. Hi, Kelsey. Hey, Bonnie, thanks for the great overview. Um, real quick about the features on Dione, uh -huh. the putative cryovolcanic things. You mentioned new information from Candy about the lack of any atmospheric um, signature, but could it still have been a past event, or do you have any other information you think you've gathered about that? Um, I think probably what it indicates is there's some sporadic activity, and then, you know, you have this gaseous atmosphere for a while, and then it either um, gets recreated under the surface or, you know, somehow escapes the moon, that's probably what's happening. Because we did look at it again, but, but there are other detections of an, atmosphere's, of an atmosphere by the fields and particles experiment. Okay. So it wasn't just that one time. Great, thanks. Any other comments or questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Body again. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
of rock from ice. So there could have been melting of the ice in the past, which would indicate a liquid water history on Mimas. So in either case, this is no, by no means a concrete case, but it suggested that liquid water could be implicated in the history of Mimas. Moving on to Dione, there's been some interesting geophysical studies looking at the um, gravitational coefficients derived from gravitational field measurements. And this figure here kind of nicely summarizes that if you take two of the degree two parameters, there's this sweet spot of consistency you can derive to estimate the moment of inertia factor. And a uniform body has a factor of about 0.4, and Dione is inferred to have a factor that's significantly below that, indicating that there is a degree of differentiation, a rocky core, if you will, and what was interesting about that is this rocky core is also derived to have a low density. So the two conclusions here is first, since there is a rocky core, you probably needed to have ice melting to form the thing. And then second, this process of making a low density rocky core implies hydration of the silicates. So water rock interaction, as I'll describe later on in this talk, that leads to the generation of sources of chemical energy. So this is important for habitability. In, in more re recent refined analysis, this was some later on in 2016, a detailed look at the um, gravity and top topog topography data and, and shape data with an isostatic model of minimum stress it outlined the conditions for the ice shell ocean relationship in their dimensions. So you can see here that the ocean is thought to be um, about 50 kilometers deep or so, 65 kilometers deep. And so it's overlain by a very thick ice shell, which maybe could explain why there's no obvious signs of outgassing on Dione. But nevertheless, if you have a 65 kilometer deep global ocean, that seems pretty impressive to someone like me. Just as a reference port, the Mariana Trench is the deepest point in the Earth's oceans. It's 11 kilometers deep. So there you have it. Uh, moving right along to Titan, this is discussed in fantastic detail earlier on, so I won't go over too much of it, but one of the key findings of Cassini is that Titan is wet on the surface. There are these liquid hydrocarbons. So you might imagine Titan's surface being like this gasoline world, and this was shown initially by some of these observations during the Huygens descent, indicating the flow of liquid methane, which was sculpting and carving out the landscape in these fantastic drainage valley networks. And then on the middle of the slide here is a recent mosaic of radar images showing the North Polar region, which is dominated by these three eerie dark bodies here, which are actually large seas of liquid methane. And more recent work, and I just found out about this quite recently, is that people on the radar team are actually able to piece together a lot of details about the um, properties of these liquid bodies, these, these seas. It's been found by the absorption of microwave and the returns of echoes from the bottom of these lakes that they're able to make estimates of the volume of the stuff. So it's about 70,000 cubic kilometers. And just again, to give you a terrestrial point of reference, this is like 35 times Earth's mass of fossil fuel reserves. So this is a lot of stuff, right? And these bodies are also thought to be methane rich because of the microwave absorption. Uh, so this is just kind of a fun thing to introduce, so let's talk about weird life, because it's, it's naturally a topic of interest now that we know that there are liquids on the surface of Titan. And there's been a couple studies looking at the potential for weird life, and you might imagine that there could be an energy cycle that involves abiotic chemistry along with a hypothetical type of biochemistry. So you could imagine, that, and we definitely know from the Cassini data, that there is photolysis and photochemical processing of methane which liberates hydrogen molecules from the methane and also forms more carbon-rich products, such as acetylene shown here. And Chris McKay and Heather Smith from 2005, this is around the arrival time of the Huygens probe, did some calculations and they asked, well, using the environmental conditions on Titan, how much free energy would be released if you were a microbe standing on the surface of Titan and you were to catalyze the reverse reaction in what I call respiration. So if an organism were to breathe the H2 molecules, recombine the hydrogen with the carbon and remake the methane, you'd actually get a nice jolt of energy out of that process. And that was 
quantified quite nicely by this study here. You can see acetylene is really the breadwinner here, over 300 kilojoules per mole of energy. Uh, in more recent times, there's been some interest. This is a hot story in the news last year about the potential to form cellular type structures in liquid methane on Titan. So it's thought that life needs cell-like structures or some kind of compartmentalization to separate life from non-life. And one candidate that was proposed based on its presence on Titan is acrylonitrile. So there are these molecular dynamic simulations done by people at Cornell University. And this is a pretty cool image showing the predicted structure of acrylonitrile molecules aggregating to form this cell-like structure. And what's curious about this structure is it has a high stability under these conditions, and it also has an eerily similar flexibility to lipid-based bilayer membranes on the earth in water. So this is kind of cool stuff. Um, and I won't go too much about the, the second ocean on Titan. So Titan is now known to be a, a world of two oceans. There's also thought to be a subsurface liquid water ocean. And this has primarily been inferred based on geophysical measurements, such as the gravity field, the rotation rate, the observed topography at the surface. And there's also, Jean-Pierre mentioned, the electric field measurements by the Huygens probe during its descent. So we now think that there's a liquid water ocean down there. Its properties aren't very well understood. It could be covered by 50 to 100 kilometers of water ice. And then below that, it's still not completely certain if there are high pressure phases of ice or if the liquid might be in direct contact with the rocky core. Some of the more recent models suggest that this ocean could be very salty. So it was a press release comparing this ocean to the Dead Sea on the Earth. And the astrobiological implications remain to be explored. Moving right along to Enceladus, as Bonnie described some of the fantastic data from Cassini. Uh, this is one of perhaps the biggest finding of Cassini, in, in my biased view, of course, is that Enceladus is active, and it's the smallest known body that's geologically active in the solar system and the universe, for that matter. Um, it forms this gigantic plume. You can see in this right-hand image here. And this plume, just the violence of it cannot be matched by the gravity of Enceladus. You can see how far it extends into space, and it's fed by over 100 jets, along with some combination of these continuous curtain-like emissions that were discussed. And this is our conceptual model for what we think is going on. Where does this plume come from? Well, we think this plume comes from a liquid water ocean that's in contact with a rocky core, and then there's some type of plumbing system and these fractures and cracks and networks of cracks that allow the liquid water to percolate and erupt to the surface forming the plume. And the reason we know this structure is present is because we we're able to fly Cassini through the plume shown here. And one of the key initial pieces of data were, was actually tasting the plumes. We were able to sample it with our, our compositional instruments in situ. And one of the findings by the, the cosmic dust analyzers, this is a mass spectrometer that measures the composition of the ice grains in the plume. It found that these ice grains are surprisingly salty. So beyond water, the next most abundant thing in the plumes is actually sodium chloride or table salt. So this is the, the smoky, salty gun that we had not just a freshwater water fresh body of water, but it's actually an uh, ocean in contact with rock. Uh, we also had measurements by the ion and neutral mass spectrometer, shown in the previous talk, of the full range of the composition up to 100 mass units here. And you can see a lot of uh, simple molecules are found, like water, methane, ammonia, and CO2. But as emphasized previously, what was not expected is that we found all sorts of organic compounds, which are now understood to be produced inside the instrument from even more complex, heavier organic precursors. So this is really exciting from an astrobiological standpoint because now we not only have the evidence for the liquid water, but there are organic molecules in contact with the liquid water in the subsurface of Enceladus. More recently, you might have heard about the idea that there could be hydrothermal systems inside Enceladus. And the first piece of evidence was, again, provided by this cosmic dust analyzer instrument where they found silicon, high silicon concentrations in dust grains which were tracked to emit from Enceladus. And these dust grains are now thought to be produced 
when mineral-laden hydrothermal fluids that are enriched in silica mix with the cold liquid water ocean, and during that process, different minerals can precipitate, and they form these silica nanoparticles, which are detected in space. So it's quite interesting. The ion and neutral mass spectrometer has performed measurements of hydrogen, molecular H2, which corroborate that initial finding and inference of hydrothermal vents. It's now thought that the hydrogen is produced by water-rock interactions in the geochemical process known as serpentinization, transforms igneous rocks into altered rocks. And what's exciting about this process is it's associated with the support, the geochemical support of microbial ecosystems, which eventually can support even more fantastic forms of life, such as shrimp shown in this image here. And you can sort of think of, about this whole system from a microbial standpoint as having a Thanksgiving feast provided on a conveyor belt that just kind of keeps on churning along when hydrothermal fluids are continuously delivering geochemical forms of energy. What I found, uh, particularly inspiring about this data set provided by Cassini is we now have a, a sufficiently comprehensive suite of measurements that we can move beyond simple qualitative broad statements and we can start addressing issues related to quantitative habitability. So in essence, we can start actually doing some serious geochemistry, which is pretty sweet. Um, just to briefly show you how this works, so we can quantify something known as a chemical affinity, which is related to how much free energy is available in an environment. We do that using theoretical parameters shown here, as well as parameters related to the environmental conditions provided by Cassini. This is how much energy methanogens, microbes that gain energy by making methane, need. So if you're a methanogen, you need this maintenance energy to stay alive. And this is the range of pH that's been estimated from the Cassini data set, around 9 to 11, consistent with serpentinization. And now if we overlay the constraints on hydrogen from the Cassini measurements, here's where we are. This is a sweet spot that we infer as the energetic state of Enceladus's ocean. So you can see it's quite a bit above that threshold line to stay alive. So it, it appears that the energy supply on Enceladus is quite a bit larger than the demand. So we conclude that Enceladus is energetically habitable. And what's Really interesting about that and taking us to the end of Cassini is we now have completed our complete survey of the general requirements for life as we know it. Liquid water plus organics plus energy in an extraterrestrial environment. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Questions for this paper? So there seem to be two types of moons uh, around the gas giants. So because for Enceladus, you have a counterpart in Europa around Jupiter, where you probably also have the contact of the liquid water ocean with the silicates in the core. And then you have Titan and Ganymede, on the other hand, where you may have the liquid water ocean between the two layers. So astrobiologically, it's important. Uh, would you care to comment on which of these moons have a better chance to have developed uh, life or to have the better habitability conditions? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. It's, it's easy to think that places like Europa and Celtus could be more habitable because there would be more exchange of chemicals and sources of energy between the deeper interior and the ocean, which maintain these states of chemical disequilibrium to support life. I think for Titan, I would be a little premature if I strike too heavy at it, because there have been some recent work suggesting that there could still be chemical communication between the deeper interior and the liquid water ocean. And indeed, argon-40 is found in the atmosphere of Titan, which provides observational evidence for that. Yeah, and of course you have also the issue of how do you go through the ice uh, crust, both in the case of Europa or something else, and the case of Titan, and how do you communicate. But it's very interesting, um, and indeed the extremophiles also, that we do a lot of research in uh, laboratories. is mm -hmm. It's very important to, to look at all these aspects and get an interpretation. Right, completely agree. Any other questions, comments? If not, let's thank Chris again. Thank you very much.
Uh, and uh, the last paper in this session is by Olivia Moussis on the origin of the Saturnian system after the Cassini-Huygens mission. Hello, everyone. So, as you guess, it's very challenging to speak about the origin of the Saturnian system in a few minutes. But let's go. It's a nice challenge. Uh, so, of course, I will talk first about um, what we can say about, uh, the, um, about the interior of, of Saturn. And um, after, we'll uh, discuss about the satellite and the rings. So, f the first thing is uh, this comparison that you see here, uh, which shows you the volatile enrichment um, so far measured in the atmospheres of uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So you can see that despite the, uh, the wonderful set of data we got from Cassini, you can see that in the case of Saturn, we got carbon, where the measurement is, is uh, reliable, I think, and uh, we got also sulfur and phosphine. These two later measurements, I think they remain to be confirmed. If you compare with Jupiter, uh, there is a big lack of data, in particular in the case of the noble gas oxygen and so on. And it, is, um, it comes from the fact that uh, the measurements made at Jupiter were, were coming from the Galileo probe. Of course, the oxygen determination of Galileo were not, uh, was not representative. But uh, in the case of Saturn, you, we, we have almost the same set of data if you compare them with uh, Uranus and Neptune. So if you want to, uh, to uh, measure the interior of Saturn, there is no other way to, uh, to than sending uh, an atmospheric probe in the atmosphere of Saturn. Um, okay, so I was talking about the volatile enrichment, uh, so the, the slide you, 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 you saw. And now you can see in this slide uh, the, a comparison between the different isotopic uh, measurements made in the giant planets. Of course, so you have a large set of data in the case of Jupiter. We have helium-3 over helium-4. We, uh, we have, of course, D2H, uh, C12 over C C13, and so on. And in the case of Saturn, we have D2H, C12 over 13, and uh, um, a lower limit for the N14 to N15 determination. In the case of Uranus and Neptune, we have only uh, uh, D2H. So there is almost nothing in the case of Saturn. So what we can do with, um, if we can have access to this kind of determination, what we can do with, that's the question. We'll see later. Uh, about the interior of Saturn, so uh, I show you this paper by uh, Jonathan Fortney and colleagues, which show you uh, a comparison between the interiors of Jupiter and, uh, and Saturn. Unfortunately, this paper is not yet published. It is uh, in the future, in the forthcoming Cambridge book. And this, this uh, diagram was made in 2014, so well before Juno and the gas casting grand finale. But at that time, it was the comparison we got between the two, the, the two interiors. And since Juno, uh, it is, uh, for example, the, the right diagram, you can see that Juno allowed to refine the interior models of Jupiter. And one of the key findings of Juno uh, was uh, was repre is represented by uh, um, at the bottom uh, here, and you can see that now we think that uh, the core of Jupiter is partly diluted in the hydrogen-rich envelope. So uh, what we will have with the gravity measurement by the Cassini Grand Finale, my underst understanding is that these data are actually under um, they are examined, but it's um, it's likely that we don't, will not have access to the same level of data because the number of orbits of Cassini, the Cassini, Cassini Grand Finale is much smaller than what we can be done be, with Juno. Uh, so that's interesting. So it's, depending on the results we have with the Grand Finale, it would be, we will need maybe to have a Juno-like spacecraft around Saturn. Uh, one of the key uh, questions which remains uh, today is how the volatiles were deliver delivered to, to Saturn. And uh, there are several scenarios. There are, many, there are much more scenarios than the three ones which are shown here. But uh, these are the three main existing scenarios. So, th of course, there is uh, the scenario by Toby Owen and colleagues and Barnum et al. and colleagues in which the authors advocate that the building blocks of Saturn or Jupiter were made from amorphous ice. In this case, this amorphous ice 
originates from ISM. The volatiles were adsorbed on the surface of the ice, and this, this is the way that these volatiles were delivered to the atmosphere of the forming giant planets. Another scenario is the scenario by Tristan Guillou and uh, Ricardo Huizo. Uh, this uh, scenario combines delivery of solids and uh, delivery of gas, which uh, of volatiles which are in the gas phase, and the gas phase which ha will have been um, enriched in the disk due to photo evaporation. So it's a combination of two mechanisms. And the last one, which is of course the clatteration scenario, which was, popular, which was uh, popularized by uh, Daniel Gauthier. And uh, so in this case, we assume that uh, volatiles are trapped in cages, uh, which uh, are later agglomerated to form the building blocks of Saturn. All these three scenarios uh, could explain what we know about the enrichment of Saturn. The problem is, uh, how, which one was uh, the dominant one? That's the question. So we, to answer to this question, we need to send a deep probe in the atmosphere of Saturn, because each scenario has its own pattern. Uh, for example, the flat scenario makes different predictions if you compare it to the photo evaporation scenario to the amorphous ice scenario. So if we make precise measurements of the volatile enrichment in, this, um, in, the, in the atmosphere of Saturn, we could be able to, uh, uh, to disentangle between this existing scenario. Be careful because this slide has been made for Uranus and Neptune, but the, the trend is similar for Saturn. Uh, that, that's, imp that's important. Uh, the other point is, um, of course, there could be some uh, compositional gradient in the envelope of Saturn. It's an open question, but regardless of this compositional gradient, if there is no fractionation between the different volatiles, uh, the, what we predict remains accurate. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, something which is very interesting also is the determination, the measurement of the isotopic ratios among the different volatiles in the atmosphere of Saturn. And I can provide you a nice, ex a nice um, example. Recently, the Rosetta spacecraft uh, has measured the xenon isotopic composition in the comet shurimov jarsimenko And um, so you can see in, on the figure that uh, the, solar wind, uh, the solar wind is represented by the, the orange line. And you can see that, OK, it's, it's, um, okay it's, it's, it's normalized. Everything is normalized compared to the solar wind. And you can see that the xenon 134 and xenon 136 are depleted, so very strongly depleted depleted in the measurement of churimov jarsimenko So there are two solutions. Either these measurements are wrong, why not? I, okay, I would say no, it's accurate, it's a mass spectrometer. Either these measurements are correct, but if it is the case, it means that these isotopes were supplied in the comet uh, from a different mixture of um, uh, nucleosynthesis, um, I would say, from different reservoirs of isotopes compared to the solar wind. So that's very interesting because if it is a case in this comet, if the same material was used in uh, was used in the building blocks of Saturn, we should be able to retrace this pattern in the atmosphere atmosphere of Saturn. That would be very interesting to measure the isotopes of xenon in the atmosphere of Saturn to see the comparison with churimov jarsimenko uh, now let's let's go to the, the origin of the regular satellites of Saturn. So uh, I will um, I will start start my discussion with something which is very basic. Imagine you form your your, sat your satellites in in a circumplanetary circumplanetary disk around Saturn. There are three solutions for your, the formation of the building blocks of the satellite. First possibility is the, for, the building blocks of the satellites were formed in the subnebula itself. They condensed because the subnebula was initially very warm, very hot. Another possibility is that the building blocks of the satellites were formed in the protosolar nebula, but they migrated towards the subnebula and they, uh, they, um, they, uh, they got a partial, they, they got a partial voltization because of the progressive uh, heating temperature in the subdisk. Another possibility is, uh, the, um, is that the building blocks of the satellites formed the protosolar nebula and were not altered by the subnebula. Uh, in the case of Saturn satellites, we face either to case B or to case C, as we shall see now. Uh, imagine that um, your satellites were, their building blocks were formed in the uh, subnebula itself. In this case, the gas phase in the disk. Uh, there was some gas phase chemistry. All CO was transformed into methane. All CO2 was transformed into CH4 also. And N2 have converted into ammonia. In the two other cases, because the building blocks were not condensed in the subdisk, there was no gas chemistry. There is no gas phase chemistry in the disk. 
So in this case, if you form the satellite in the case A, you can predict that all the D2H measured in the building blocks of the satellite were protosolar. And it is not the case in the, in the, in the plumes of Enceladus. Uh, what has been measured in the plumes of Enceladus is that the D2H of in water is uh, cometary. So it does not apply to Titan or Enceladus. So the two remaining points are, is there some presence of ultraviolet in, in the satellite? In the case of Enceladus, yes, there is probably, probably something at mat, at mat 28. It might be CO or N2. In the case of Titan, we can see that, we, we know that the N2 is not primordial and, um, and CO is a minor species. So um, in the case of Titan, we, we think that the building blocks of Titan could be simply partially devolatilized. In the case of, Ence of Enceladus, it's more complicated because uh, the mass 28, what we see today, could be something which is primitive or not primitive because it, will be, it could be generated by uh, chemical reactions in the, in the body. In any case, we have on this uh, flow chart, we have several predictions for each case, and each case uh, requires pressure, pr precise uh, mass spectrometry measurement. I will not go into details, but I can tell you that each case has, a, uh, with each case we can make a prediction which can be measured by, by, via mass spectrometry. Um, in, the case of in the case of the rings, we can, exa we can exactly say the same thing. There are, there, there, is not, there are not so many uh, different formation scenarios for the rings. Either the rings are a remnant of the circumplementary disk, either, they're, either they're, they're building blocks come from the PSN, or like the, or like the satellite, but either the building, building blocks come from the come from the protosolar nebula and they got some alteration during their migration. So we, similarly to the satellites, we can make some predictions about the D2H in water, for example, in the rings, the N14 to N15 ratio and some noble gas uh, ratios. The problem is that uh, it seems that um, the rings are only made of ice according to spectroscopy observations. So if it, is, if, if it is the case, the most robust criterion to disentangle between these different origins would be uh, to measure the D2H in this material. Okay, <clears throat> next. Okay, so um, simply, uh, if you want to, to investigate the origin of the Saturn system after Cassini, uh, of course, we recommend atmospheric probes, of course, to constrain the chemical and isotopic abundances of key chemical species in the atmosphere of Saturn. And for example, there were several proposals submitted to NASA and ESA, the NASA Sprite proposal led by Amy Simon, and the ESA, um, the ESA HERA proposal led by uh, an, American, an European team and uh, US colleagues. Um, it seems that if we want to assess strongly the interior models of Saturn, a Juno-like orbiter will still be mandatory. And if you want to measure the in situ, if you want to measure the composition of the rings, you need to send mini probes with high resolution mass spectrometer. And it is exactly the same uh, kind of uh, instrument we need to send at Titan and Enceladus to precisely measure the atmosphere composition and the plumes of Enceladus. And for example, there is actually there, there was a proposal for NASA Dragonfly and the health proposals submitted to New Frontier. So Dragonfly is still in competition. We'll see what happens. Uh, <clears throat> so, of course, I can uh, present you, uh, I can show you this slide which represents the, the Hera Saturn Pro proposal, which has been submitted to M5, uh, the M5 call of ESA. It's still in competition. We are a small dozen of proposals. We are still in, comp in competition. Of course, if Europe wants to send a probe in the atmosphere of Saturn, we need a carrier. And uh, actually, in Europe, we don't know how to do that. We need a contribution from NASA. So it will be, of course, uh, uh, a NASA-ESA partnership. In, in this case, for example, NASA could, could supply the spacecraft, the orbiter of Saturn, an orbiter going to, to Titan or Enceladus, and ESA will supply the, uh, the probe itself. And um, to finish my talk, I just want to show you this slide. Uh, the HERA team has already uh, started to work on, on the possibility of sending, uh, uh, yes, thank you, sending, uh, the idea of sending a probe in the atmosphere of, Saturn, of Uranus and Neptune. That's important because the specifications of uh, Uranus, oh, sorry, I come back to, the, to this slide. Um, yes, thanks, next, next, thank you very much. So this slide shows you the, the, the suite of scientific instruments aboard um, a Saturn probe. And the two key instruments are the mass spectrometer and the atmospheric structure instrument. If you don't have these two instruments aboard your probe, it's useless. So these uh, instruments are mandatory. And 
at least we need a high resolution for the mass spectrometer. Next, next slide, please. Thank you. And to finish my talk, I just want to let you know that the HERA team has worked on, uh, um, on the um, scientific rationale for Uranus and Neptune institute exploration. The interesting thing is that a Uranus probe or a Neptune, Neptune probe, they all share the same specifications as a Saturn probe. So all these probes, all these planets can be explored with the same probes. All these probes will be twins. That's the important point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olivier. Questions for Olivier? So I have two, <laughs> but it's curiosity questions. One, uh, maybe to you and Linda both. What exactly are the measurements we expect from the dive of the Cassini uh, a spacecraft into Saturn during the grand finale event? Are there any particular measurements that we expect that could help with, with with knowing Saturn a little bit better and its origin and evolution. A little bit? Not um, at the same level as uh, Juno. No? No, okay. not at the same extent. It's not at the same level. Uh, okay, and I was wondering about the migration scenario, you know, in the solar system. Is there something in the measurements we get uh, for Saturn now or in the future that would help? Uh, That's a good question. Imagine, for example, in the case of Jupiter, okay, so she is in the room, I think, but um, how reliable are the isotopic measurements made, made at Jupiter uh, in the case of the noble gas? I think they are not as much reliable. But the idea, if, the idea for example, if you compare the, the isotopes of xenon in, that, in the Saturn's atmosphere with those uh, in the atmosphere of Jupiter, if you see some difference in the case of Saturn, if you see the same patterns as in churyumov jarcimenko we know that churyumov jarcimenko formed at a high, very high less centric distance. And if in the case of Jupiter, we see that the, we have the same pattern as in the solar wind, clearly it's evidence of migration in the case of Saturn. That could be yes, a, a very nice observation. Okay, great. All right, any other questions or comments? Okay, if not, with Olivier, I would like to thank all the speakers of today's session and come back tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow, Friday, if you want to hear more about the Cassini mission and the fabulous results, we have uh, session PS 3.1 starting in room M2 in the morning and then going into room B in the afternoon. And we also have the David Bates medal there tomorrow morning by Bruno Bazaar. So we hope to see you there. <laughs>